out online as well. Review of board norms, begin our meeting on time. Do our homeworks before the meeting. Be professional, discuss the ideas, not the person. Be clear and concise. Seek first to understand, support decisions, and always praise the positives. At this time, I'd seek a motion for approval of agenda, consent agenda, with identifications of items to be taken off the consent agenda for discussion and or separate action. So moved. moved by Mr. Bicek. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Long. Anything to be removed? Go ahead. I would like to uh, have the memo of understanding with the Boys and Girls Club removed. Uh, where are we at here? 16A. Thank you. There it is. Anything else to be removed? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Motion passes. Gifts to the district. Mr. Schaefer, could you share those with us, please? Yes. A monetary donation of $100 was donated to the high school band program by the Ron Meyer family. Um, big thank you from the district and from the board to the Meyer family for uh, their generous gift and to all those that continue to support our district and our kids. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. It's always great to see those that are supporting our district uh, in so many ways. Uh, next agenda item, recognition. Dr. Ebert will recognize staff that meet the criteria outlined in the newly approved above and beyond program. Dr. Ebert. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm bringing uh, two more uh, deserving individuals back to you, uh, school board, uh, in regards to our above and beyond program, um, which uh, allows us to recognize employees that go above and beyond the call of duty, whether it's impacting uh, a student, uh, a family, the community, in a way outside of their typical uh, job responsibilities. Never do we want to minimize all the work that all of our staff is doing that goes above and beyond, but some of these specific uh, people that have, have come before you, um, th there's a theme there uh, that I think you're seeing and following, um, a different above and beyond theme that uh, we want to continue to celebrate. So I think you'll, you'll, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, as we go along, but um, we have two people tonight, and the first person that I'd like to bring to the front is Sarah Gangler, and she is right here, so come on up, Sarah. So this is Sarah Gangler, and I'm going to talk to you about her. And after that, then you'll have the chance to ask a couple of questions and get a little uh, feedback from her. So Sarah Gangler is an American Sign Language interpreter in our school district. Sarah was hired last year through an agency to serve the language needs of a student that moved into our district. This past summer, Sarah and I spent a significant amount of time trying to figure out how it would look if she became a permanent part of our staff here in the Keele Area School District. Well, we figured it out, and here she is, a valuable member of our school district. She was hired to primarily sign the delivery of curriculum and all other communications for one particular student in our elementary school. Sarah has done a whole lot more than that this year, and I'm excited to tell you about it. For example, Sarah has started the ASL Club at, at Zelanus. What is that, you might ask? It's the American Sign Language Club. I asked Sarah why she started this club, and she, and, and she said that she wants to make signing cool at Zelanus. She also said that it will help to make the student that she works with disability seem less visible on its own if more people are, are using signs throughout our building. At this time, over 60% of the fourth grade class has been part of the club, which meets often and learns sign language. Sarah says that the club makes the student she works with feel included and makes things accessible to her so that kids can communicate with her and they're doing it, actually doing it on a daily basis. Sarah says it's nice to see kids signing with her, with the other, with the student, and it makes sign language more tangible and understandable. Sarah also does something known as captioning. Sarah works with her fourth grade, the fourth grade teacher that, of the classroom the student is in and takes every video that's used in the class and creates captioning on the video so that her student can read along with the video in real time while she signs. Sarah says that her student would miss so much of the videos if it was not closed captioned. 
She takes all the videos ahead of time and has to have them ready to go prior to the delivery in class. Um, let's see here. Sarah says she could just interpret the videos, but if that's the case, then much is lost. So, and, and this was very eye-opening to me. I'm going to explain it without reading my notes here, where she explained to me that if she's interpreting, let's just say there's a funny scene in a video or something they're watching, and she's interpreting it, the whole class may laugh at it why, and, and giggle, and the student she's working with is still waiting for the signs to, to be interpreted, and then might have to laugh at a later time. Get it? But with the captioning there, she can read and, and see the signs and the captioning at the same time. So in real time, she can react to the videos. Again, this is just the second example that I shared of something that really doesn't fall within her job description. Um, and I'll, I'll share what that means in just a second. Um, so, and finally, um, Sarah also has been working on a language lab with a science theme uh, and has emailed that to all of the staff to show to their, cl to their classes. Doing this because it should not be limited to just fourth grade, she said, and wanted, wanted to do something for all the students to learn basic sign language in the school. She also included Laura Furdick on this project to add the learning of some Spanish concepts as well. Sarah says that the student she works with is not going to interact only with fourth graders, rather many students, and so the entire school should know some pieces to be able to interact with, with this student. Kids see... Her signing, the student using sign, and Sarah using sign, and so now it's cool. And they understand what is happening, and more people then talk to this student in her language. When does Sarah have time for this, you might ask? The answer is after her normal school work hours, because she's with, the, with this student all day, signing everywhere she goes. All right. With that, we're going to show a little video clip that Sarah has sent out. I believe, was it to all staff? Did you send it up to everybody yet? Okay. This is an example of just a couple of minutes of what the language lab is right is yep. like, correct? This is our language lab. Okay. Hey Raiders, hope you're having a great January. Welcome back to the Language Lab. 
Let's get started, girl. Well, first, we're going to think about this question. In seven weeks, it's our winter like this. And we say, in <laughs> But we say, in Vernon. Right? <laughs> So that word is cold, and the ASL is cold. <laughs> In Spanish, cold is frío. So frío and cold. <clears throat> Next, we will say it's cold outside because in winter it's so cold outside. In Spanish, we say hace frío. That's tricky one in ASL because we have to stay outside cold for the whole time like this. So in winter, or in Frerno, also winter, <laughs> outside frio, and outside cold. Exactly. When it's cold, there is usually snow. Snow in Spanish is nieve. I love snow and nieve. And we could use a lot more of it. <laughs> and our last word this month is good. Four and middle. And we figure it spell the first three letters. So it is J A N. All right. Let me piece this all together. J A N. Or Nero. <laughs> Is winter. <laughs> and it's hace frio. Hace frio. And we may have nieve or snow. Boom! Nailed it! Yeah! Awesome! Thank you so much, girl. Hope you had fun learning our five new experiments. And you, would, you can use these not only here at school, but also at home. Thanks all for the January Language Lab. Bye! <laughs> all right, board members and community. So Sarah was recognized in, in front of her building principal, Chad, in his office, also here at the board meeting. Um, and so that is uh, Sarah Gangler. So um, I think we should give her a round of applause and then ask her a few questions. Anything from board members? Sarah, does it uh, take an extensive amount of time for you to be trained to do sign? Is, it, is there a school you go to or, and it's a fairly extensive training? Yes. Is this working? Yeah, OK, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> I graduated from UW-Milwaukee's interpreter training program. It's a four-year degree. I actually started sign language in high school, though, so I had a little up on my classmates. <laughs> as you, you know, the student that you're working with, as her classmates are learning more language, besides just being able to communicate, have you noticed a difference in how the student feels in terms of comfort level and things like that? Yeah. Um, I don't even know how to explain it, but she went from a very small circle last year of the kids who initiated that learning on their own to now, because it's cool, her circle is much bigger. Thank you. Could you share a little bit more about the rest of the school and, and, and the uh, lab, particularly since you talk about the, how the circle is expanding now for getting more students involved throughout the school and then hopefully ultimately through the district, what kind of impacts are you seeing there and how, how quickly are the students looking forward to that? I mean, I guess the biggest impact on me is I had a student come to me about three weeks ago and they said they were so excited about what I was doing because they have a deaf individual in their family that they've never been able to communicate with before. And they used to communicate through a tablet and pictures and now he's able to sign with that family member. So it's going farther than the school, farther than my student and it's great. Is there a lot of, uh, uh, use or need for this are, are we seeing are you seeing more districts having someone like yourself as a resource because of you know the need for them absolutely in wisconsin there's about half a million documented hearing losses 
And currently we're in what they call an interpreter drought. There's not enough interpreters. There's not enough interpreters graduating to become certified. And so a lot of school districts are in pickles of sending their kids to WSD because they can't find interpreters and WSD is becoming overwhelmed. WSD is Wisconsin School for the Deaf. Thank you. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I just want to say, um, if your goal was to make it cool, I think you nailed it. Just like it said <laughs> in the video, um, that was awesome. Um, and I just, I just can't think of, you know, it's one thing to go into this and to serve an individual who need, who has that particular need, but just the enrichment that the other mm -hmm. students get out of this, that uh, gives you chills. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we have one more individual to uh, discuss tonight in honor, and that is Kathy, Ram Kathy Raminger, and she's a Kiel Middle School secretary. So I'm going to invite Kathy Raminger to come on up. <laughs> All right. So Kathy Raminger um, does a multitude of things for Kiel Middle School. Um, we all know that. There are a multitude of things also that she does above and beyond her primary duties. So Kathy, um, and I'll just, I'm gonna go through some of those, some of those things. She steps into cover for others during recess, um, excuse me, she, she steps into cover for other recess and lunch supervisors when needed without being asked. <clears throat> she says, we do what we have to do wherever help is needed and we take care of each other. She also steps in frequently to cover bus supervision when a staff member forgets or there's a reason that a staff member is out. Just picks it up uh, and takes care of it on her own. Kathy says that when she sees that something needs to be covered, she does it and just doesn't complain. She stays late when needed. Oh, I just bumped my... Hold on. <laughs> she stays late when needed to finish up from a busy day and doesn't record it on her time card. She frequently can be seen staying late and talking to parents after hours. Kathy says she doesn't want to rush parents and get them out of here at four because she has to leave. She says it's about building relationships with families and kids, and if she needs to stay late, then she does. Sometimes kids are still here and need a ride at four, and she just stays until they're picked up beyond four o'clock. She's known to help to de-escalate drama when students come into the office. She works with kids that come looking for help and will not turn anyone away. So she talks with, discusses, and tries to make students feel better. Certainly not part of her job description, um, but we know that it happens in, an, in a school office, and it happens frequently, and she steps up and takes care of kids. Kathy has stepped, up, stepped in to help teachers de-escalate students who are having a bad day, as well as teachers who might be struggling for a personal reason or need to take a quick break or use the bathroom. These type of situations happen often. She's known to um, be the one that, that is there for the staff to, to help them out. She says, I don't want the teachers to be in a bad spot, and I like to make sure the staff is okay. And I try to give them a little break if I need to, just to help them. Kathy goes above and beyond to create a positive office environment. For example, she created uh, what's known as Glitter Wednesdays. She wears anything glittery, glittery and encourages students and staff to play along. Another example of positivity was bringing in a, a king cake uh, during Mardi Gras. It's a Mardi Gras tradition of a cake with a, a small plastic baby hidden inside. The person who finds a baby is said to have <laughs> prosperity and luck throughout the year. Kathy says, I want to be part of a place where I want to come to work. When people are positive, everyone else around you, everyone else is positive, and they're willing to go above and beyond. And finally, Kathy has stepped in when the principal secretary was out. She's able to quickly learn about scheduling and job responsibilities, not in her own role. She kept the office on track for an extended period of time so the building could start the year without a lot of issues. She did many tasks, not in her own role. Kathy says, we just do what we have to do. And I just love being here with the kids and I'm here for the staff. With that, I just again present you Kathy Raminger. It is Wednesday, and she is a little glittery today. <laughs> Has anybody else picked up on the glitter? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm mostly with the fifth grade, which yeah, gives me that connection and it's always on a Wednesday. Do that consistency for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess I'll speak quickly. I've had, I've been very fortunate to be able to interact with Kathy, both as a parent, having both my, my children go through the middle school as, as well as part of my role on the school board. And um, the thing that impresses me most about Kathy is that it's not necessarily the skills she has, but it's the character she has inside and that innate ability that she's got that warmth and more and even more importantly for our students the approachability um i both of my myself and both of my my children um oftentimes would look to you for answers um and many times maybe those answers were maybe not something that was part of your job but they felt very comfortable going to you and asking how do i do this or where do i get that because they knew that you would treat them respectfully with the answers and not um Put them down for not knowing the answers but thank you i, I really have to say thank you because i know that you're like that for every student in the district thank you yeah i'll just say too i mean it's a it's a glowing example of <clears throat> it takes no matter what your role what your title whatever it really it, you know you can see that it's a passion to be in that environment and to do whatever you can but not just not just for the students but knowing that teachers other employees need to have that outlet and if you can provide that that you'll we're willing to do that because ultimately when you can provide that you're providing something that outlet for them so they're gonna be better for the kids when they're right in front of them so that recognition and seeing both sides of how how that school has to operate is fantastic so thank you mm -hmm. thank you an example of you know not just a great employee but a great person i mean those are the kind of values we want to instill in our families mm -hmm. and our children and and uh, i think that this district is striving for each and every day so thank you for exemplifying that thank you thank you thank you, thank you kathy thank thanks both of you next uh, agenda item is a discussion item uh, meet with coaches, advisors, and booster club members to discuss fundraising. Uh, Stuart kind of brought this forward, uh, seems like a couple weeks ago, but it might have been a couple years ago almost <laughs> already. Um, if you want to sort of lead this a little bit, Stuart, um, if we could invite some of those people forward, grab some chairs, or get a little closer to the microphone if you could. I'm not sure how many we have here today. But we have sure. Mr. Walsh here, we have a couple coaches. Um, sure, pull up a bunch of chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I appreciate you being here. I hope that uh, we can have some dialogue and discuss some ideas and thoughts. Um, what precipitated this was uh, feedback from parents, business people, and a number of others. Um, as well as also my experience on the board of our fundraising activities and I'll be truthful with you it's it's pretty slow and onerous as far as a process on our end um, and I think we've seen particularly with the booster club how successful the booster club is with getting more people and particularly community more community members involved there maybe better networked with some you know whether it's various parent groups or business groups. A um, couple examples I'll give to you is some parents, of course, have complained that, gee, it's you know always something. It's the cookies, it's the pizzas, it's you know everything. And when the booster club formed, we didn't want to take any of that away from anybody. So I'm not suggesting that those opportunities are taken away from any clubs of what they've done in the past. But they felt as if I don't know what's coming down the pipe. So is there a master schedule, a master calendar that's coming out that I know with what programs are doing what? And so they can plan accordingly because i think most people want to contribute to every organization and support every organization but they're not necessarily sure how to catch every organization unless they have a student that's coming to their door or reaching out to them likewise businesses are often um, sought out to donate items um, for larger um, items but also they're also reached out by the students themselves 
And there's sometimes some concern about, well, you know, I want to make a bigger donation. How do I make sure that it goes to everybody? Or how maybe do I provide some sort of support without having to say, well, I just gave a big donation to the booster club and I didn't really budget any additional money for what comes later in, later in the year by this particular group or that particular group. So they asked, you know, if there was some sort of a, a recognition program that can be done in the community with um, having different levels of the businesses, whether it's like a platinum, you know, gold, silver, bronze level, and then maybe getting like a window clean so that they can also put it up in their business windows and kind of brag about it. But then also might be the signal of, you know, we know that person's already contributed. So I'm not going to knock on their door looking for something unless, of course, they ask for that, because I think there's other groups that have some very good information out there um, to reach out. And they've been told by various uh, businesses, hey, if you need something, let me know. I know that Dr. Eberts had some conversations with local businesses. Uh, one in particular, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, where the business owner says, you're not coming to me enough. Come to me more. Let me know what, what what's needed. Yes. And I believe that the booster club, the coaches, the, the staff and teachers that, you know, are dealing with all these, the PTP, the PC, uh, you know, all the uh, various groups that are doing, whether it's the Mathathon or Spellathon at the elementary school all, all the way up to the high school, better understands what's going on and how to maximize that. I think as a school board, I'm going to speak for myself, so I may get some disagreement here, but we've had some opportunities also for some sponsorship um, recently with the upgrades to the athletic field. I don't think as a school board, we handled it very well. We had a lot of different ideas and a little different thoughts about what we thought would be appropriate level and how to do it. Whereas I think having a community group that maybe includes some business people, you guys might be able to move a lot quicker on it, faster and consistent, consistently and know better what those values are and making sure that those uh, businesses and or individuals feel that they are getting fair treatment for their contributions. So as a school board, we need to continue to have some sort of oversight over it um, to ensure that it's being done fairly, um, ethically as well. But my opinion is we need help and we need your help because I believe you guys are the experts and wanted to start the dialogue and the conversation of how do we do that? And, and um, every year, twice a year, we have this big long list that we get from all the various teachers, clubs, groups, and whatever, with their fundraising requests that we approve or don't approve. And then ultimately they all get approved because how do we go through that and say, well, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a bad idea. Yes, you can do that. No, you can't do that. You know, so we just approve them basically, you know, for right or wrong because we don't have the time to go through everyone, nor do we have we taken the time to develop a budget to say every year, these are all the different groups and organizations that they're looking for to raise funds for, whether it's the first grade class that's raising money for a field trip or whatever. What is that total overall budget? Just similar to what we have um, with the Rainbow downtown, you know, showing what, have we reached our mark? Are we, are we, have we met our fundraising requirements or how far are we coming up short? every year. There may be individuals that are, that are contributing now, but if they knew that some things aren't being fundraised sufficiently and something's not happening, such as a field trip or something like, well, had I known that, I would have done more. There's no communication on that end. So I apologize. I'm a little verbose. Try to, you know, you know so I'm throwing a lot at, at you, but is this something that we can pursue and we should pursue or Am I out on the deep end on my own here? So, so if I can interject, I was hoping to keep this whole conversation about a half hour, at least get the conversation going tonight. Um, Stuart, love your ideas. Can we piece them out? I, I heard master plan first. Can, can, we, uh, can, we, can we do it that way a little bit and let them answer that? Because that was a, a verbose, it was a very nice way of saying right. it. <laughs> I, think, I think truthfully though, I don't want to dictate the okay. ideas. I want to know whether, I just threw out a couple ideas. I want to know if we can put together a group and whether they feel as if there's a group that's willing to work on this and they can come up with the ideas. You know, I don't want to steer any particular direction. I just want to provide the feedback. And if you want my participation, I will participate. But I want to know if there's a, a willingness to go down this path. To kind of tackle all those issues as, as a... 
Gentlemen, any thoughts or who would like to take the lead? I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll just start by saying in my role, when the, that Sheila sends out that fundraiser request and I send it out to the, the advisors, I flat out tell them, realize we don't want to be hitting the same demographics over and over. Uh, try to think outside the box and come up with something new. I, I, I don't want volleyball in the, the fall, basketball in the winter, and then baseball in the spring selling cookie dough. Let's be a little bit outside the box here. Um, and over the course of the last couple of years, I think that's happened. The boys basketball team, their fundraiser is doing the football games on the radio and they sell those ads. That's their fundraiser. So um, <clears throat> I know Coach Vandermuse this year, he did a, a raffle for the girls basketball team. Something outside the box had bigger prizes. Um, the Booster Club has been awesome. They, they have, and Pete, correct me if I'm wrong here, when they came to be part of their mission was to try to eliminate some of the going from business to business to business with every program hit it, trying to hit them up for donations, whereas the Booster Club is just going to take it on and then encompass it. And they do a great job, but that still leaves all the other activities to do their fundraising because that pot of money that they have would be gone probably by October 1st. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's a good pot of money, but it's still just not enough. Um, and every program's different. And the football team, they, they do the their uh, varsity gold fundraiser card, Raider card, and that's very successful for them. And they're the only program in the school district that does that. So they've kind of got that market. Um, like I said, the volleyball team did cookie dough in the fall. Baseball and softball, they team up, and they do cookie dough in the spring. So there's nothing in the winter. So it's kind of spaced out, and I, I try to encourage that. Uh, one of the things that I know a lot of the groups, and I think Mr. Friend and Mr. Bondi have looked into it, is the Packers offer a lot of times to bring in a group to, to do stuff. There was one group that made almost like $30,000 this football season just by going up there and volunteering their time. But they also have a requirement we need – 45 people to do this. So that's where we get stuck on some of those outside the box things. But um, I, th I think that it's a good conversation. I don't know if there's a right or a wrong, like you said, Stuart. Uh, at the end of the day, I think that it's good that we have the booster club that we can go and they can get those big ticket items, maybe help us out. Like when they help the, the FFA and our club with their trips, that was a good chunk of money to help alleviate some of the costs for the kids. But when you go down to basketball and figure out what's in the budget, they need some smaller ticket items. And the, the kids also want stuff too. So we can kind of hold that golden carrot out there and say, okay, if we do this, you, you have ownership of this. But how, how big do you want it? And they can take some pride in that too. So I'll digress to, to Peter or somebody else. Yeah, you know, as Steve said, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of questions in, in what you said. And I think, you know, we got to look at what, what are the main problems we're seeing. You know, one of them probably is the business is getting hit up multiple times and not knowing where people are coming from. Um, we have heard that, that some businesses aren't getting approached. When we did our uh, calendar raffle last year, there was more that wanted to get on there than we had days in that month. So, um, but I think we got to identify those first and then kind of go at that. The, the Booster Club, our goal from, the, from day one was, like Steve said, to try to centralize that, give some of the co-curriculars that don't have the fundraising ability, aren't a large, you know, don't, not as big of a group, that ability to just come to us, work with us, work concessions, work our fundraisers, and not do their own. And then they can, they have that pool of money. That's always been our goal. And I think we can still work towards that. But like Steve said, I think you're going to have your bigger groups. There's always going to be that money. There's going to be those tournament expenses, things you can't really foresee every year that are going to be difficult. And I think you're always going to have certain groups are going to do their own thing. It's a slow process, but I think we can keep moving towards where we, where the booster club is maybe, you know, we do more of those large ones. We get those groups involved and eliminate some of that. As far as like a budget or figure that out, that too is very difficult. You know, the booster club, we're a little separate, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously part of the district, not quite the same as the advisors and the coaches doing their fundraising. So, um, 
but I, you know, we have a good process. We have a good relationship with Steve when it comes to working with all the co-curriculars, you know, he knows all them. He's got a good relationship and we keep striving for that, you know, have them come to us, um, whether it's first or second, whether they want to come to us first and see how much money we have. And then if we don't, then they do their fundraising. I know they have to get their approvals though, you know, a semester in advance. We, you know, we're fundraising throughout the year. We do have our major, you know, fundraisers that we've been doing and, and you know, we have our triathlon, we have our larger uncorked event, we, we call it, whether it's a calendar raffle, a big raffle or, or the actual in-person event um, and then concessions and, you know, other things like that. Um, so I think it's a work in progress, you know, it's gonna, if we keep striving towards that, but, and, and, and the advertising, I think on the field and that's, you know, an approach to the businesses to make sure that they're all involved. We've talked about that at our last um, Booster Club meeting. Um, and Brad May was great with the, you know, you can see in the, the baseball diamond how he's reached out to the businesses over the years and got them with the advertising. So, you know, we have that template and we hope to expand that to, you know, um, the, the main complex, even the um, softball field, stuff like that, as a way to, to approach the businesses, make sure that, you know, they, they, it, the ones that want to get involved, advertising, you know, um, but back to that, that main issue of, of the businesses getting hit up constantly like that, I, that's, I don't, I don't have a good answer, but I think, you know, we're always working towards that. So I'll pass it off to Jamie, our girls basketball coach. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I think for, you know, I'm the new guy here, so I'm not really familiar with what's happened in the past, but, um, you know, for me, you know, I came in with a fundraising plan for our program. And it was really a hybrid approach of what do we have that's internal we can we can tap into, which you know we have worked the booster club uh, you know football games and we've got and we've done that. Um, we've also um, I went to the Optimist Club meeting and I presented to them about our program and what we're trying to accomplish and um, did those things. But I think for me, part of part of coaching is also developing kids for life and. I think part of having them have to go out and knock on a door or, or to an uncle or, or anybody is part of is part of having to get in front of somebody and sell something and networking. And so for me, you know, I don't want to be the coach who says, well, we're always just going to go work a tournament and we fill, and get money. That's the easy button. I think there's all, I, th I think there's some value in having a hybrid of, we can, we can tap into that, but we also can go do some things on our own that, help develop our kids. And I, th I think we've done that for basketball this year. And I think the other part of it is for, from a budgeting standpoint, it's kind of difficult because, you know, for me, when I go to sell something to, to somebody, I want to be tangible. So we're going to use this money for X, right? And that's why they want to give because they know the money's going here. Well, this year we need, this year we, you know, being a new coach and new, you know, new program, we did, we did a lot. <laughs> we did a ton this year because because we were just doing a lot of different new stuff, but that might not be the case next year, all right? So I don't want to be going into this kind of um, robotic system of I'm, I'm always tapping into this money and then also I'm like, well, I'm not even using it, <laughs> right? To me, that's almost as negative, <laughs> right? So for me, I think it's, um, I'm not sure the right answer is either. I think there's different silos. I mean, for me, like going to a company, you know, I'm, I'm a, I own my own business, you know, I'm a marketing guy, I mean, for me, you know, putting my stock in a football field is different than buying uniforms for, you know, buying a teacher for a basketball program. That's, that to me is totally different. You know, the selling point of business is how many thousands of people are going to come in and see your sign on my football field. <laughs> That's totally different than I want to buy some warm ups for my girls for basketball, in my opinion. Right. So um, to me, it's a, I guess it's, it's a pretty um, broad area. Obviously, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I guess for me as a coach, I would always like to have um, some ability to do some things on our own because I think the kids need to do that. I really do. Um, and I will say, coming from where, from where I came from, I, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody that, that we, you know, the Booster Club and, and Cabo because um, where I came from, we had none of that. I mean, I, I could not feel more support as a coach from a – you know, from a resource standpoint than I am here. So I, I just want to say thank you to all those who are helping us out because not, not everybody has that. So this is kind of a good problem to have is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> so.
I'll just kind of expand on the one thing Jamie said about the girls or the kids in general going out there. It's also a recruitment <clears throat> tool. If they're out, they're out there, they can tell you the positives and how much fun they're having in the program. And that word starts to spread. And that can be a recruitment tool for them too to help increase numbers, hopefully at some point. I just want to add, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. And, and the suggestion of having the dialogue wasn't to take any of that away just as when we promoted the booster club wasn't to take anything away from any of the clubs of what they were doing before. But I think that there's a lot of best practices and things that can be shared across the boundaries and as well as also better understanding of what's going on and even maybe some networking. I'm happy to hear that, that Jamie's had a very good experience in his first year here because I'll be honest with you, a new coach coming in and trying to find what, what's available and what's not, not available can be very daunting, particularly if it was a different story here. Um, and then how do you build that? So knowing that we have something that's good to build from is, is great. Um, but how do we take something that's good and make it better? And I think that's just, I'm just trying to bring the people forward that I felt that could be helpful when I was receiving feedback as a school board member. And of course, we know community members, it's like, well, you're, you have to do something about this. Well, you know, I don't have control over the booster club directly. I can provide some feedback, but- Always looking for members. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, but that's why I just wanted to have the dialogue and, and have the dialogue here in open session versus me talking to one of you at a game about some things that have come back or thoughts. Let's I, have the discussion here. I think the other part of it too, is that the coaches and advisors are really, on top of where they're at, since I've been in this position, I'll use the track team, for instance, they haven't done a single fundraiser. Well, I should take that back. They did a pop socket one a couple of years ago. Now, that was the only fundraiser they've done because they have the money in their, their account and they've been slowly whittling that down. And they've actually said, mm, maybe next year, year after, maybe we'll, we'll do a fundraiser. Uh, I know that I have one for archery and I, I haven't used it for a couple of years because we haven't had the state archery competition. So I haven't done any more fundraising. So I think the, the staff members and coaches and advisors are actually pretty well on top of that too. So that if they don't need to go on fundraise, they're not doing it just for the sake of doing it. So do you guys have a master list of all fundraisers that you could do, like people solicit to you? I mean, who would have think of selling cookie dough? I wouldn't have, unless somebody came up with the idea. And I think so it's, the, it's one of those things that once you, get into, I'll use coaching as the example, and you go to a clinic, they have their sales spiel going on. There's about 30 different vendors there that you can do whatever you want. Uh, so once you get hooked up with one of them, they they have so many options. They, I mean, the, back when I was a kid, it was wrapping paper. I don't, I don't see wrapping paper as much anymore. So. Oh, Steve. <laughs> and that's okay because I don't wrap gifts, I buy bags because I'm terrible. I mean, but, if somebody could compile almost a list then of those 30 vendors and say, okay, this is what's out there for everybody, for not only sports, but other extracurriculars as well. These right. are possible fundraising sources. Correct. And and I, I, I get those, I'd say, I'd probably get emails from random fundraising companies probably twice, maybe three times a month. And I just send it out to my email group of coaches and advisors and go, hey, here's a different one. Maybe think of doing this or look into it. So, uh, yeah, and it just, well, the, the Packer one came out today and there was, there was another one just the other day too. So, Mr. Fun, do you have anything to add? Sure. I'll just address that too. Uh, I'll tell you, once you go to one of those clinics and you get on one list, <laughs> mailing list, you're on all the mailing list. Um, so, yeah, I get I'm not kidding, 20 or 30 different flyers every year for different ideas for fundraising. Um, but we're blessed that we have our main two for the FFA. Um, and going back to your comments about, you know, in good years, if you sometimes cancel those, especially if it's a traditional one, we actually hear from the community that we didn't do it. Um, like two years ago, we didn't do our pizza sale, the homemade pizza one we do for FFA. And we had people calling disappointed, wanting to know where the heck they were. So, um, you know, there there is that expectation with some of the sales out there that you better do it. I can't imagine what would ever happen if we didn't do grilled cheese at the kill picnic. So, right. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, there's going to be those traditional ones that that are always going to stand. But again, the, the the booster club was was developed for that group that 
um, co-curricular and not just sports, you know, there's all the other co-curriculars. Maybe they don't want to sell those candy bars, that simple little thing. They can come to us, work some concessions, work some other things and get some funding that way. So I want to make sure everybody's aware that that's where that umbrella group, you know, for that. Now, again, um, you know, plenty of the, uh, of the groups have been doing certain things. They work well and the community expects it. So we expect those to continue really. Um, but yeah, you know, all these different little, you know, candy bars and other, you know, things like that. The hope is that we don't have to have a lot of those if, unless, you know, uh, again, a sport really wants that or they, they want to get those kids out there. And again, that is not a bad thing. Kids going out there interacting with their community. So, um, but, you know, we, we, a couple of things that we discussed too, you know, we have like kind of a wish list, we call it with the booster club. And it was supposed to be kind of a twice a year um, request to the booster club for kind of large items that pe that the groups may know that they, and we've been lax on that. We kind of allow the groups to come almost any month. You know, we thought about tightening that up a little bit so we can plan a little more throughout the year. Maybe have those two times a year where those are those bigger requests, obviously tournaments, um, bus trips, things like that, that, you know, you can't anticipate, you know, um, girls basketball makes it to state and now we're going to help pay for some th different things. You know, those are the kind of things that we want to be there for that we can do quickly within a month. Um, but we do have a process, we do have a funds request form, and, and we can tighten that up a little bit just so we can kind of have a, a better idea yearly, you know, that's, you know, kind of getting towards some of those those issues you see, Stuart. Yeah. No, so so can, can I cut you off, Stuart? Sure, please. Um, I don't want to run out of time here. Um, any of the board members have questions or thoughts they want to add at this time? Go ahead, Dan. Uh, just as a what if kind of thing, would it make sense? Uh, I, I think this doing a group thing, a discussion like Stuart's proposing, I think has high merit, but would it make some sense to, uh, do any of you uh, have a, an awareness of some district that's really got a good program and how they do it, you know, or do some research in, you know, are there some schools that really have a, you know, like I say, a productive program that might you know, that we could, you know, to some extent emulate and, you know, certainly modify to our needs. Does that make sense? Having been around athletics in co-curriculars basically my whole life and seeing a lot of different models, there, it's a hodgepodge. I mean, there, you can go up to, I'll use Bayport as an example. They're going to have a football booster club, a basketball booster club, a baseball booster club, and they're all separate. And that's all run through the school. Then you'll come here and we have this main booster club that we're trying to do. And then you might have a couple offshoots like the cross country booster club has one sock. There's a soccer club. And I, I, I don't even count the like community groups like Cabo and the soccer club and the Peel baseball club. I don't count those really as the group because they're, I wouldn't, I don't even know how to really explain it. They're, they're a separate entity that ends up, contributing to the, the district in different ways, not just financially, but it, it's a hodgepodge wherever you go, every, every place is going to be different, but the ones that have kind of the same setup that we have here, I see them doing basically the same kind of things that we do. They might have a big silent auction party get together with a band like they uh, on court was last weekend, or they're doing the concession stands with big tailgate items and that kind of stuff. So it, I think that we're kind of just on par with what everybody else is doing. I, I haven't seen one that is just so much different than what we're doing here. Uh, it's the ones that have the big ones, that, that's more socioeconomic driven than functional setup driven. Any other questions before I get you, Stuart? Yeah. Sorry. There's a question, I, go far. I, go ahead, Randy. I, again, not, not having had kids in the district, um, but having bought my fair share of bad cookie dough and pizzas. Um, Randy, guess, did you try the cookie dough frozen and just eat it raw? <laughs> that is really, really good. Either, either way, it wasn't very <laughs> There's good. places around that sell that for a dollar a puck. Yeah, well, uh, again, lots of, lots of bad product. But anyway, um, I guess what, what I, I, again, I, I, I'd like to see is, okay, so what, I mean, I, I've seen, when we were working on the, the, the Performing Arts Center in the field, I saw a list of some of the stuff that the, the main booster club has done. But I would be curious as to, you know, what is all the stuff we're buying? 
And you know, the, the obvious question is, is somewhere along the line, the district hasn't set aside money for that sort of thing. But you know, at, at what point in time should the district maybe be doing some of that? Or in cases of other groups that I've been involved in, pretty soon one group got warm up jerseys. So now everybody else has got to do warm up jerseys and do we really need all those warm up jerseys. And so just as an example, so I, I guess I'd like to see what it is we're all raising money for and is there a way that we can streamline either by covering more of that through the school budget, which again will be an interesting conversation. But because um, one, of, one of the things that's, that's really stuck with me since the challenge day thing is that those kids that aren't from affluent families who are either having to ante up to go on field trips or to you know, participate in some of our sports um, or are, are asked to sell stuff and really don't have families they can go back to and peddle it to. I mean, that in the challenge day conversation, that can be pretty daunting to some of those kids in that lower economic spectrum. And, and I walked away from that challenge day thing saying, you know, are we, are we doing too much of this stuff? So I, I don't have an answer for it. It's just something I keep running around in my head, but. From the budget standpoint, I'll say I'll gladly take more money. Uh, just, just knowing <laughs> what my budget is, uh, I, I'll use for instance, for basketball, I, Jamie's budget this year was nine basketballs. Yeah. Seriously, that, that, that was his budget. I haven't given a set amount and I have to allocate it all to everybody else. So once I get the requests, I, I kind of prioritize what is needed. I mean, for baseball, they're going through 10 to, to, to 11 dozen baseballs a season just because leather rips and they get hit in the woods and you don't find them. So they're going through a lot of baseballs and a dozen baseballs is $72. So you got $800 just in baseballs. You have $700 just in basketballs. So uh, the, the actual budget that we have, I'll, I'll speak to that, Randy, it, it gets them the bare necessity. So anything above and beyond is pretty much what they do through their fundraising account. Um, Charles could probably echo this, but I'm sending purchase requests over a lot of times with different training aids, so soccer bots, is buying all sorts of training aids for practices. Uh, basketball's done it. At every sport's doing that just because it's not covered in the general budget that we have. So they're, they're doing it to supplement the budget. Probably 50% of their equipment is doing that. And that, that might, that's a ballpark guess. Could, could you talk a little bit about what Mr. Ohm kind of discussed in terms of our families who are economically disadvantaged? I know every fundraiser has a goal. Uh, you know, raffle tickets was 10. Somehow I did not win, so we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, yeah. No. Okay, then, well, okay, okay. Um, but I mean, I think everyone has a goal, but there's also families who just don't meet that. And I think there's ways we can support them or are supporting them. Right. Uh, I do know that I've been at a number of practices where they do their kickoff for their fundraiser, and I have never once heard a coach say, you have to do this. It's encouraged, step outside of your box. I know that when I've done fundraisers, I, I just, whatever they bring back, if they make an attempt, I'm happy. Uh, it, it's the not even putting yourself out there that is more the frustrating part to me. Uh, but yeah, there, there are times where you might not socioeconomically be able to, to afford it or you, you're a transplant, you know nobody. Um, it's, so it's kind of hard to approach people, but at the same time, I, I see it the other way. This is my way to interact with the community and get to know those people. So it, it's kind of like, like Jamie said, that happy medium of getting out there and putting yourself out there and learning those life skills as well. Uh, just quickly on the, so, uh, on the raffle, part of that was there was X amount of tickets. So some schools would have said, if you sell your 10, come back, I'm going to give you 10 more. What I told the girls was, if you sold your 10 and you have more, ask your teammates who didn't sell their 10. 
I can tell you there was a few girls who sold zero. But guess what? Every ticket got sold. So they had a network within each other to accomplish the goal. And to me, that was part of what was awesome about it. So, you know, some of those kids, like, you know, yeah, they didn't, you know, they didn't have the resources to go to or they didn't have the, maybe the economic means to participate themselves, but they figured it out together. And that to me was part of the awesomeness of what we did. Did that answer your question, yeah, and Stuart, we're gonna think about wrapping this yep. up, and, and that's, maybe and that's what I'm going to try to wrap it up here because I know I just want to make sure, make sure that it's clear that uh, nobody was upset when they talked to me. Nobody was complaining in the sense that they were they were angry about what's going on. I just was asked to bring up the conversation to see if there's opportunities to find improvements. Um, and I think probably the, the number one that maybe we didn't discuss here is that for the business owner that wants to make sure he's supporting every group, they know that Booster Club is there, but they don't necessarily know. They want to make sure that even if there's a group that's not asking for money this year, that that group is also still being supported, even though they didn't ask for money. So is there a way that we can use the Booster Club as an umbrella to say, you know, if you want to make sure that you're supporting every group, come to us. We'll make sure it happens. Yeah, real quick on that. You know, we're the um, the advertisement for the uh, complex and everything. We're starting that off. We're trying to find somebody to kind of head up that committee. So that's going to be an opportunity, I think, for us to really talk to the community members about, you know, that advertising and make sure that they know exactly what we do. And and we've been trying to get that out to everybody that you know we are that umbrella group that all co-curriculars, you know, not just the sports because that's you hear that. You know, it's like, well, yeah, football gets this you know, basketball gets all the money. It's like, nope, we're there for everybody. So we just, and that's, you're right. That's a good opportunity, I think, for us to make sure that's out to the to, uh, the businesses. Thank you. Uh, steps moving forward. Uh, do that, that was going to be my anyone? question, I guess, is, is, is should we have more discussions at the board level like this and updates and just provide it? Like I said, I'm trying to be a conduit to provide the feedback from some, from what I've heard. Or do we try to get together outside of a board um, does the booster club want, like you said, I know the booster club is looking for people. So do we put a call out and, and make sure that we get it on the, on, on the website and, and the next major meeting and try to bring, uh, some diverse people together that are not currently participating, but wish to, and have some skills that they feel they can bring to the booster club. Uh, you already said that you're looking for somebody to head up a certain committee. So would that perhaps be a next step to support these groups? Yeah, for the booster club, I mean, these guys already have enough work to do. But for us, you know, I, I, we're obviously willing to do what we need to do to get the word out for booster club. So, yeah. So how can we help? That's that, like you said. That that was really it. I don't think yeah. we're doing as good a job as we can. So how can we help? I, yeah, you know, we've said it. Um, more members, more people interested in booster club. I guess helping out. And and our our hope was always to get it from the parents that have kids involved in, in activities. We don't want, we'd love to have the coaches and advisors come to our meetings, um, but we don't want them taking on those roles. We want the parents to, to come in. And I get that not everybody has the opportunity or the, or the time to do that, but if we can just get a couple from every group, um, that would do wonders for us. It, would, it gives us that tie in to those, to those uh, co-curriculars. Um, they get some ownership. And then, you know, it helps our, our cause too. I think it just gets it, everybody together. So that's always been, um, you know, what we kind of strive for is try to try to get that. So I guess that, yeah, if we can get that word out um, and, and if the board can help us in that uh, regard, that'd be great. Thank you for coming in this evening. Yeah, Appreciate your time. Us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep moving along. The agenda is still fairly lengthy yet. Uh, Dr. Ebert, uh, presentations. Do you want to introduce uh, everyone? So we have a so we have a fantastic group of uh, three leaders that had our um, e schools across our district, and they are going to present um, the annual virtual schools report. So Dr. Sixel, Katrina Pianic, and uh, Mr. Raminger are going to come up and. Oh, excuse me, and Mr. Hendricks um, will present our annual virtual schools report here this evening. Thank you.
I guess I can start out. Um, this report, just so that we know, is from the last school year. So when we're looking at the report, think these numbers and information reflects the 2020 to 2021 school year. And so it runs September 1st through August 31st of the school year. And this is the first time we have a report for two virtual schools in our district because we opened them between the lakes last year. And we just put a little blurb on the beginning stating, you know, we are anticipating five students when we are initially talking and obviously COVID hit and we started partnerships with partnering districts. So our numbers are way different than what we anticipated. So the intro, just a little bit of information on that. As we go through this report, we'll just put some highlights out and then also give some current information along the way too. Does that sound good? So we kind of intertwine kind of where we're currently at. Um, so just because of the new partnerships, we listed, we had five partners um, partnering schools and we had 134 students from those partnering districts. This year, we have 25 partnering districts and active for semester, like these numbers change daily. Students come and go daily um, in this virtual world. So when I ran the numbers today, we had 248 partnering districts students. So the 134 was overall for the year. Last year, just active today is 248. There was many more that have come and gone. Um, I think I had 52 new students just starting semester two from partnering districts that we had to get up and going brand new for beginning of the school year. So just wanted to kind of give you an overall for partnering districts. Sheila, if you want to scroll down. The governing board. Sure. Um, we just wanted to acknowledge our governing board members who are listed there. Um, Don Mogensen is here. Thank you, Don. Don's in a lot of our meetings. He is also on our eSchool governing board meeting, our governing board, and has been there for a number of years. Um, so we thank you, Don. The other person who is listed there, Rodney Schmall, has been with the eSchool for 20 years, um, serving on the planning committee and also as a governing board and eSchool member as well for um, 20 years and recently has stepped down. So one thing that we just want to always highlight and remember that the Wisconsin eSchool Network is a partnership throughout the state for uh, how we get access to our curriculum and behind the scenes systems. With that, um, Keel was a founder of the Wisconsin eSchool Network and we're actually celebrating 20 years for the Wisconsin eSchool Network. This year is actually Keel's eSchool charter is 20 year celebration actually. So because the Wisconsin eSchool Network was started kind of a year after Kill eSchool started with a partnership with Appleton. But that um, has grown the network and it's been an awesome support. And we're very proud that Kill was one of the founders of that network. I think something that doesn't always go noticed is Katrina Pionic's role with uh, the Keeley School, um, just so you as a board know, she is one of the, uh, when you think about those leaders within the state of Wisconsin and, and online education, Katrina would be considered one of the founders, and that's a compliment. Um, when we went to the Slate Convention, which is bringing all the latest technology advances, uh, the Women Network um, recognized some, some important people throughout the, the way, so Katrina, thank you for your leadership, it's been incredible. Uh, so some enrollment numbers um, from last year the, for BTL, uh, we had 109 students. Um, now that includes open enrollment students. So I think the number to remember with that is, is those students chose to stay in Kiel that we could have potentially lost and open enrolled out when we went through COVID. So um, that's just not them choosing to enroll in our online school, but choosing not to enroll in another school. Um, so that's a that's a big number. Um, and as Katrina mentioned with the partnerships, Oakfield, Dodgeland, Judah, Houstonsford, and Horicon would be considered some of those original members. Um, we had some middle school electives as well. Um, health, life management skills, 
to the art and beginning Spanish. I know there's some changes this year. Um, and the staff uh, in our original year gets in it of Dr. Sixel and myself. Um, we work very well together. We do split up the schools into more of a K-4, 5-8, but lots of crossover and conversation. Um, Katrina is considered our program lead as well. Um, and the local mentor teachers consisted of Chris Christopherson and Sarah Raminger. And we had 30 part-time online teachers. Sorry, we're not, just because Doug didn't get a little yeah. bit off, people, kind of right. where we're at. people might be wondering, this is our annual report from last year, but you might also be wondering kind of where we are this year. So we wanted to share some numbers. Um, Katrina had already mentioned that we have increased our number of um, new students, 50, 52 new students this semester from partnering districts. And they, and again, they come, you know, daily. Um, when we talk about the open enrolled students or students that are in our district, um, we have another 23 of those students. Uh, we have also included our offline families. We started with two families that we added. Um, if you remember, Rita Lilliquist is that teacher liaison and overseeing those families. We have increased that to seven families from two families. And now we have, what is it, 27 students from originally nine students. Um, other things just to mention here, uh, Mr. Raminger mentioned our electives. We've increased that to seven electives for middle school students. Um, our model has also changed um, since the very beginning. We had, as you saw, 30 part-time online teachers, many of whom were teaching um, asynchronously for us while also teaching full-time for the Keele School District. And what we've done this year is we've changed the model and we have four teachers who are teaching synchronously, meaning that they have live sessions. They have a schedule um, for students to attend. And as Mr. Raminger said, we break that apart into the elementary and then um, six, eight, for example. So we'll have um, you know, two teachers teaching ELA and math, for example, with 70 students, and then another teacher that will be teaching uh, science and social studies with that same number of students. Uh, we also have a 4K that should actually, well, that was the annual report from last year, so yes, that was K, but now it is 4K. So we have a 4K program this year, and a 4K teacher, and a teacher of record. Um, we've also added a registrar, so thank you, we brought a Registrar to the um, board for approval. And as I mentioned, mentioned before, we added um, Rita Lilliquist as a teacher liaison, who is a teacher of record, um, helping us out and doing a lot of coordinating, a lot of uh, social media for Between the Lakes, marketing, recruiting, those type of things. I'm probably forgetting something. So Chad or Katrina, you want to add anything else from this year? Oh, I missed a big one. But maybe you're going to mention it. Okay, <laughs> I missed a big one. One of the big ones that we um, applied for and wrote was the grant. So we did um, receive a $500,000 grant for Between the Lakes Virtual Academy. And that is being used for a number of things. We cannot use it for staff. However, we can use it for startup of equipment, professional development, those types of things. Um, One of the things with the transition from last year to this year and bringing on a lot of new partner districts, that means you're working with volumes of people. Dr. Ebert does a great job of, of making our presence known uh, statewide. When you draw that down, then what you're doing is you're trying to target those that would really be uh, uh, boots on the ground. So uh, we have a variety of coaches that are established in all the other districts that work in collaboration with us. When we hold staff meetings, we have virtual staff meetings. Uh, we actually have parent meetings. Um, we have special ed meetings. So the really the, the presence that we're trying to build as a school, albeit you can't see the brick and mortar, is that it's truly evolving into a school. Um, and that's the part that we're seeing how it's quickly evolving. So as, as was indicated, thank you for the registrar. So as you try to, when we launched this, it always said, what's good for kids? 
that was the foundation that never wavered. That's why we changed our model from 30 part-time teachers, as Deb said, to four synchronous teachers. So when the transition happens, it starts and ends with what's best for kids. So I think that's when you evolve and you have 25 districts. Our goal is to have good coaches, to work with them, have high-end communication. A lot of the behind the scenes things that Katrina is doing is keeping those lines of communication open. Deb and I get emails as well daily with how do you problem solve this? How do you work through this IEP with a student that has this disability in a virtual platform? So I think that transition working together has helped us kind of work with the school. I'm just gonna comment on that right, right away, Chad, since it's fresh. Um, that is probably the biggest thing that is different from even last year to this year is I worked with five school districts and probably had one or two contacts from each of those districts. This year is different with the 25 partners. I think I only have one or two districts that I work with one or two staff members from their district. Probably the rest of them, I almost have done 10 different people I'm emailing and communicating with for various reasons because of special ed, because of how they split up the counseling between the students. Um, there's tech people, there's student information people. Um, Sheila knows it, that we have emails coming in about you know different um, system things. So I think that's part of it too. It's not just I work with 25 different people because that's how many districts we have, is that I have possibly 10 people from every district that I'm trying to juggle and keep up with too. So, but it's also a learning process um, with it of how do we streamline some of that and um, the more they get trained in their district, um, hopefully they can answer some of the questions locally too. So I think we can continue on to the Kiel E-School. So then we separated out the Kiel E-School and hopefully um, some people that have been on the board for a while maybe have seen reports like this um, over the years. It's um, fairly set up the same in the regards to just quick snapshot. So one thing I failed to put in this report though, it is our 20 years, 20 years of operation um, for the charter school. This chart here, actually you can scroll down a little bit, is our only local enrollments. I will start a chart moving forward with partnering districts now that will be a second year of dealing with partnering districts. But this is just local enrollments and you can see you know, the graph for our local enrollments. With this, this is by course um, enrollments, not by student, this graph. So it's how many courses students are um, taking, um, whether they're full-time or part-time. So just wanted to make sure you saw that. Sheila, you can scroll down kind of toward the bottom. Okay, semester course completions. The one thing I did highlight, uh, wanna highlight, we had 58 students at one point. You know, we touched as a full-time student at some point throughout the year last year due to COVID. I mean, um, this year we're back to more normal 14, 15 students that are full-time that are keel. Most of them are open enrolled, um, but we have some local within the district that are opting to full-time. The one thing that I do want, I'm always proud of with keel with our local students, we have a 95% success rate of students completing those courses. And that is due to our amazing coaches that we do have local that stay on those kids, reach out to them and build a personal relationship with them beyond just, hey, get your work done and stuff. But um, so that's, I think we, that's probably my biggest, I wanna say, test of how well we're doing on with our local kids on keeping that success rate up. So um, again, I'm just highlighting a few things throughout. Um, you can look at it in more detail. It's broken up into how many students at the high school level of those partnering districts. Um, the one thing I am gonna point out is the start, the second star down is 393 semester seats right there. Um, we seat swap with the Wisconsin eSchool Network, so we share teachers and students. With that, um, we had 322 more students that we served than we, you wanna say, gave to out, outside of district. Uh, so that brings in money, obviously, to our district. This year, we're gonna be way down for the fact that our partnering district students took those spots that our teachers needed to serve first. So our numbers, I have not seen the numbers yet this year, um, but I just know that it's gonna be down. Just one takes from the other for that. Um, 
Do you want to talk yeah, about the blended? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have a variety of teachers that use that material. So their kids in our brick and mortar school, um, Sarah Raminger, for example, in my building, um, uses that online curriculum for her U.S. history class. Um, I don't know some math in the middle school and some of those other areas. Um, then at the bottom, you just see all the different courses. Um, me being new as well, I think this is a great thing for our kids. Um, I can remember as a student, I'm sure most of you, where you couldn't take a class because it didn't fit into your schedule. Our kids here in Kiel don't have to do that. Um, you can't take, you know, AP statistics um, to, you know, like Tony with a, a math example, um, being a former math teacher. We have a couple kids. I know one for sure right now is taking that through eSchool because one, we don't offer it. And in the event, he would have to do it all by himself here. He gets to take it online. Um, geometry or maybe English didn't fit in your schedule for some reason. Here's another option for kids. So it does fit. Um, and they get to do those electives that they want. They get to do band and choir and tech ed and all those great things we're doing here at the high school and fit it all in in one year, um, which I think is great for our kids and something not a lot of places have. So with core selection with our partnering districts, they do follow their local school graduation requirements and stuff. So the most time consuming part for me is working with those counselors to figure out schedules so that they're meeting their graduation requirements and stuff like that. Those counselors are still responsible for it, but it's that partnership of, you know, offering those classes and making sure it's right for them. And then at the bottom, just, you know, information about our staff. Um, we did add four new teachers last year, really to pick up some extra elective type classes because as these students are full, more full-time students, we need more electives also for them beyond the core. We were very heavy to concentrate on core over the years. And now we need to, you know, give them more variety of courses beyond the core so that they can have a full schedule for their courses. I think that's it. Anybody else have any other words to share? Okay, thank you. Yeah. If, if I can lead this conversation off, um, kudos to this district and the people that are from this district. 20 years ago, we had the foresight to do our e-school. Um, just absolutely amazing. And thank you, Ch uh, Dr. Sixel. Thank you, Mr. Raminger. Thank you, Dr. Ebert, for pushing this board to um, have the <clears throat> K through eight line, online school. I mean, the, the, we could have walked past it and, and said, "No, this is a, this is a risk, and, and we're afraid to do this." But um, thank God we proved that this is truly amazing um, what you've accomplished um, in the past two years. So I'm, I'm going to start with that. Uh, board members, any questions? <clears throat> Go ahead, Randy. Um, <clears throat> I did just wanted to be sure my notes were accurate here in terms of you talked about in the um, in the e-school you, you're running about 248 kids is that or which or is that the between the lakes one? I'm confused now. So, so for the 248 active students right now that are students from partnering districts okay. that does not include in, in any which of our school? local. The 25 partnering districts that no, no, we are but I mean which that's in between the lakes or that's across both? That's, a, that's across both. Total. Okay. If you want, um, so between the lakes and these numbers don't. I have more now than um, that even. <laughs> but that's what I mean when it's changing. There's because, rounding. Okay, I'll give you the rounding. You know, I know this is where I mean when every time I run a report, the numbers are different right. because there's kids coming and going. Um, so actually I don't have it split out. So I have overall numbers. If you, can I give you That's that? Fine. Randy? You okay. Got. So between the lakes right now for, as of this today, 160 and that's okay. partnering districts, Keel school, you know, Keel students also okay. for e-school, 135 partnering districts and Keel students. But then we also have our part-time students. I, th that is not those numbers. Partnering students, we have about 100 enrollments every quarter term. But the numbers I gave you first are full-time okay. students. Does that help? 
Yeah, I All mean, right. that gives me a sense of where we're at. Yep. The, the other question I would ask is, I, I, again, I have, I have a recollection that when we talked about starting between the lakes, there was some legal thing that didn't allow us to put the between the lakes inside the e-school umbrella. There was some time thing that had to take, that we had to get through. So it wasn't any kind of legal thing. We were applying for the grant. And in order to apply for the grant, you needed to be a new school. Okay. So right now, during our grant process, which is a four-year, we're on year one. It's a four-year grant. But yes, I... Okay. Otherwise, ideally, we would have had just... Yeah, all right. Okay. So, we're, so we've got three more years left before we can... Yes, combine them. All right. And that four years... That's what we continue to work on to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the school. Yeah. Okay. I think the other way of looking at this, when you're looking at, and I don't know if they have this sheet or not, but these are is students that we've actually had within our district that, like for example, the partners that we're going to be um, pay, who pay us, who are we're billing basically. Um, you know, 223 students from Between the Lakes Virtual Academy. So that's a way of costing that out, or from the e-school, 205 students that we will receive, you know, money that will come into the Keele Area School District. Um, as was mentioned before, we also have a number of um, open enrolled students that come directly to us because they're not part of a partnership. So that's another way that we're helping those students. It's helping Keele students. And it's also helping students remain in our district who want a different opportunity. Go ahead, Stuart. First, I want to say, you know, not just what an exceptional success the program has been thus far, but also the exceptional work that's gone into it. And um, while well, Dr. Sixel forgot briefly earlier about the grant, I didn't. And I want to, uh, you know, talk about the grant a little bit because I think that there's not a lot of understanding both from the board as well as in the community of what goes into receiving these grants. It's not just picking up a phone and saying, hey, can we have some money? Um, could you highlight both what went into the grant uh, prior to receiving it and then also what you have to continue to do for that grant money? And, and I think it's important that people understand the amount of work that goes into that. So to reflect back to last year, probably around this time, um, because I think it was due in February, a um, lot of meetings, a lot of late nights, a lot of weekends, writing, reviewing, and we had a great, um, some governing board members and some teachers that would also review it. But I think at the end of the day, I don't know if it was a 60 page document that we had to submit. Um, I want to say maybe a 25 page narrative answering questions and you know justifying what we're going to do and then supporting documents to go along with that um, charts and you know things to fill out so it was a big in document and then we did get kind of denied the first time but they had a review process and we were able to you know review it some more and resubmit um, within I think we had three weeks to do that um, and we were the second time were able to get awarded it so that was a big hurdle, um, but it also made us reflect and see what could we do to improve our current state. So that was a great reflection process also. This now that once we got re, um, awarded it, we have a monthly DPI call that we're required to attend to you know, keep with updates. But then you know, we have to follow what we put in the grant of professional development the equipment, how we're going to set it up. Um, it is focused on educationally disadvantaged students. So, you know, one big thing is we realized, I think, last year is that some students don't have that normal at home school setting that, you know, maybe some people just naturally have. So, we put some supplies and kits together that we're able to get through the grant. You know, the kids will return it in order to help some of those students that might not be able to go out and get some of those supplies um, that would you naturally find in a classroom. Um, so things like that, you know, getting the teachers set up adequately for 
teaching and it's not just here's your little Chromebook or laptop and good luck at your virtual teaching, giving them a better setup in their at home office so that they can teach those live meets and stuff like that. Am I missing anything? Yeah, great job. I, I think sometimes, you know, we... Great job. Great job, Katrina. Um, no, I just wanted to mention that it was a competitive grant. It wasn't, you know, sometimes you have formula grants that are pretty much just awarded. You fill out the paper and it's, it's good to go. But I think you explained that this was a competitive grant um, through, you know, districts throughout um, the, the state of Wisconsin, not just for a virtual school, but for a charter school. So... Um, we had that that we needed to do, and we also have, as Katrina said, a number of things that we need to do, that we need to attend, uh, reports that we need to fill out. It also, as was mentioned, gave us some time to reflect of what we really wanted this school to look like. Um, so we were, you know, brainstorming and visioning as we were writing this um, to help us formulate um, the vision for the for the school as well, because we are accountable to that grant. Um, and what we have written in there, we have to make sure that we're doing. And there are certain types of, you know, assessments that we're giving kids to make sure that, you know, we are measuring them and that they're accountable to the learning and that we are showing success. Yeah, and I think one of the things as we wrote it, you know, we, if we're having success in a brick and mortar school, and we see that, why would we not bring that into our virtual school? And that's what we did with, for example, iReady. And when we wrote the grant, and it's a competitive grant, like Deb said, it was, what are those high-end things that work for kids in a virtual environment? So all of the layers of accountability that come with it, and we're in a cohort. So there's, when we meet, we have other schools that would be like us. And we break out into small groups, and we talk about what's working, what's not working, and some of the, the so it's been a really great way to work together. Um, because a, a lot of the virtual schools, we all kind of struggle with some of the same things. And one of them is the rolling enrollments and staffing it adequately and meeting those needs. So it's been a really, um, I think, a great journey for us. And we're learning a lot along the way. If there's nothing further, I think we're ready to wrap it up. Are all the questions answered? I just had no. one real quick. One. <laughs> so uh, being, being, being mindful of time, um, we have a couple questions yet. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just, well, first, I mean, the way our, program is growing like that is truly remarkable and obviously a lot of credit goes to all the staff involved so thank you you mentioned a couple times the rolling enrollment what what's kind of the cause is that like students are finishing their program and are leaving or is it just a transient population or so rolling enrollment was from day one when the e-school started 20 years ago um, because it is access for the students whenever they need it so a lot of times it's a medical situation, a social situation, a family situation. Um, they're just, the face-to-face -face environment not, might not be working for them. And why wait to the following year to deal with that issue? Why not deal with it now? So it has been always our vision philosophy that we should never wait to start a student when we can start them now. Okay. So, and that's what causes the, the rolling enrollment. It's not easy, um, but um, it was easier two years ago, but it's still our philosophy. We're going to meet the students where they need it. So obviously the last two years, a lot of it's been COVID. You know, if a parent all of a sudden ended up with a medical situation where the parents like, I don't want them exposed to other students right now because they're dealing with some kind of family medical thing, that could be. Um, so lots of reasons why they may start or stop. Thank you. And if also, I guess, stopping in the, if it's not, if they're not successful, why wait till later also? Let's sure. transition and find the best education for them at this time. And just to, men just to mention, we do have, um, for example, failure to participate letters. We work with the districts to say, hey, maybe this isn't the best option for the students and we want to keep our success rate up as well. And why have the student, you know, be in a program that isn't for them. So again, there's a lot of discussion with our coaches and with our partner districts about their students, our students as well, if it's a good fit. Good, sir. Um, two items, I guess. Um, first one is, you know, talking about a lot of additional work and we was at our last board meeting, we recognized Katrina, understand that she's doing nights, weekends and holidays to accommodate uh, parents, but you're also talking about a lot of additional meetings that are taking place. 
um, with administration at the administrative level. Could you discuss a little bit about that? And you know, there's obviously a duplication of work for what you need to do in the brick and mortar, and then you're doing it again to a certain degree for the online school environment. And how do you manage that time of handling all of these things? Because I think it's, it, you're talking about a lot of time and a lot of effort and, and a lot of balls up in the air that you're juggling. That's one question that, that I have. And the other one is um, looking forward, we're looking right now we're measuring the success, the success based upon enrollment. And we talked about the 95% success rate for our students. When do we start seeing the numbers about all students, their success and their completions, as well as also uh, maybe survey results from the students and families in, in, in uh, partnering districts to find out how satisfied they are with the product? I'm going to answer your second question first, and then I'll take the first question that way. Um, that is something now that, you know, last year was our first year of partnering districts. This year we are going to be, you know, tracking a little bit more of that um, success rate for their classes. Um, because of the rolling enrollment, it made it difficult <laughs> last You know, I have to find a way on what, you know, what data do we really want to see and how we want um, – what data points we want to hit on um, the in regards to six we've talked about exit surveys for families that are leaving um, but then overall just end of the year type survey because we also want to hear what's working so as much as what's not working so that we can continue to look at it and improve on it but also what is working we do have parent advisory committees um, meetings throughout the year also to get that you know more informal um, feedback also of what's working, what's not. So I think the, the best way to answer this is we're very good at communicating and we know who to communicate with. So when we set up our meetings, when we meet with our teachers, we have one in Kansas, they're all over the state of Wisconsin. We're not just local. We work with them and their schedules. We work with our partner districts. So we are very much on the same page on our end. So when we disseminate it out and when we put our agendas together, we're getting better at what we know we need to fix or what we need to work on. And then we always give them a chance to ask their questions in advance. And then we kind of strategize when we put our agendas together to make sure we answer those questions. Because I think what we've learned is there's not a lot of people that are, are frustrated because they don't get answers. We're able to answer quickly we don't know, we know a lot of them from what we've been doing, but we're also able to reach out to, like when Deb and I are working with special ed issues, we'll talk to Dr. Evert or, you know, we'll work through a lot of those different pieces. So I think to answer your question is, we're good at communicating. And I think that's what helps our districts too, that partner with us. Well, Deb, if you had anything to add. I think everything pretty much has been said. I think for ourselves, just to manage it in the beginning, you know, we had a lot more um, evening meetings, informational meetings, that type of thing. Now we've started on like consolidating on, you know, certain days of the week, times um, where they are between the late meetings so that we are keeping ourselves more organized as well. Um, and putting that time aside, because obviously that time when you're, you, when you're in that, you're not in something else. So that, you know, it takes up some time um, and takes away from other things as well. Um, you know, just popping into observing our teachers, you know, that's one of the things we have to do is evaluate those teachers as well. So, you know, we are popping in and out of various um, e-school, uh, you know, sessions, lessons, teaching, so we can see what's going on. But that means we can't be in another classroom. We can't be doing something else. Thank you. Thank you. As we're moving along here, next agenda item is community feedback. I didn't receive any uh, papers. Anyone wishing for community feedback? Is there any? Seeing none, we'll move on. Superintendent, Board Communications, Dr. Ebert. All right, thank you, Mr. Meyer. A couple things to share out tonight. Uh, in no particular order, um, we, you know that we posted a Director of Teaching Learning and Learning position. We received 21 applicants for that position. Um, I personally interviewed last end of last weekend and on mon and on Monday uh, 10 candidates to narrow that down to five which are coming in 
next Monday and Wednesday to meet with the admin team and a few others, and um, we will go from there. Uh, similar to the high school principal process, if you remember, we had some additional steps where, where we spent time in their building uh, of the candidates where we narrow it down to just a couple, talk to people about them, do a real significant uh, reference check um, as well as background check. So I'm feeling pretty good that we're going to find a great person for the position. So that's just the update at this time. We posted our middle school principal position not long ago. We already have 17 applicants. It doesn't close, and close until February 18th. All right, so you have a little bit of time there left. Um, we have a couple other reminders. Um, February 15th, we know that we have a primary election uh, coming up for the school board. And so I just wanted to put that out there because we won't have another meeting prior to that primary election. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Um, I'm not going to go into a couple other items I have. I, I know I, I shared them out with parents this morning, a few items and things like that, and I've shared them out with you, so I won't double up. But you know, just as a, a quick shout out, and I, I know we give a lot of credit to our staff and uh, teaching staff, we recognize quite often. I, I just think that I maybe don't do this enough, but I'm lucky enough to work with three fantastic principals in our district, Mr. Hendricks, Mr. Raminger, and Deb Sixel. And sometimes I don't maybe say that enough in public, and I think that I, wanna, I want us to recognize the amount of time and effort because when you're an administrator of a school, uh, your, your phone just doesn't turn off. Your email doesn't turn off. You have to be aware and available really 24 hours a day every day. There's always things that come up, and someone needs to be there fielding those calls and answering, answering those calls, uh, fielding those questions, and, and those three are um, very, very dedicated to it. And so I think the three of you just wanted to say that in, in the eye of the public. So um, that's all I have for tonight, Mr. Meyer. Questions? Go ahead. I just wanted to add something about the primary. Um, as the board clerk um, for the um, the primary, I will be out of state on election day, and I've designated Sheila to accept and disseminate the unofficial results. I'll be back in time for the board canvassing, but uh, just want to make sure uh, all of the locations know this already, but I wanted to make sure that everybody else was aware that Sheila has been designated to both receive and communicate the unofficial results on that evening. I will be back sometime the following day. Thank you, Mr. Long. Anything else from any other board members? Uh, would we like a break at this time or should we keep moving along to perhaps a little bit later? So seeing no indication, we'll move on. <laughs> Business items, employee handbook changes. The current handbook language regarding the definition of a full-time employee does not align with federal standards. Changing the current definition of a full-time employee from 20 to 30 to from 20 to 30 hours worked per week will provide the school district with greater flexibility when addressing staffing issues while also limiting the financial impact to the school district. The current definition of a full-time employee does not allow for additional opportunities when needed to staff members who are currently at 20 hours per week. Is also move. You will move to approve the, the handbook changes yes. as presented Correct. by Mr. Long. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bychek. Discussion? Just for clarification, again, um, full time uh, previously at 20 hours above did not mean um, they qualified for benefits, but they weren't necessarily, um, they were prorated at a different rate. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. Um, the, it was the 20 hour threshold to qualify for health insurance at a proration. Um, but again, that created some challenges. So we uh, suggest both following the federal guidelines as well as also opening up some opportunities for us. Uh, personnel committee reviewed this and um, supported it 100%. So you're moving it up to 30? 30 hours. Okay. I'm not sure I understood that, but all right. Yep. <clears throat> Further questions before we vote? We'll vote. I'll say yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. Motion passes. Next agenda item is high school restrooms. The B&G committee has discussed the need for ADA compliant family restrooms in the high school. An RFP was sent out and one bid was submitted. 
upon review of the bid, the B&G committee is recommending C.D. Smith to upgrade the two restrooms outside the Castle Theater into four ADA compliant family restrooms at a cost of one thousand, sorry, one hundred thirty-one thousand one hundred fifty dollars using eight forty money. Let's take a motion. I so move. Well, Mr. Dietrich, is there a second? I'll Thanks. second. Oh, go ahead, Mr. I'll second. Second by Mr. Ohm. Discussion? Uh, we have, sorry, Mark, what's your first last name? Sipple. Mark Sipple here from uh, C.D. Smith. And? Trisha Malmbach. Trisha Malmbach. Sorry, Trisha, I'll remember your name next time. <laughs> from C.D. Smith, uh, to answer any questions we might have. Um, and if the uh, um, BG committee could kind of lead the conversation here, that'd be great. Well, I just, in, in my head, as I was thinking about all the, the process we've been through, um, uh, there are two things that I just want to be sure of. Is one is, is I mean, the, the pricing has is, is got some flexibility, and if we're able to secure some donated product for those, uh, I mean, we're right now we're right right now we're, we're we're supplying some of the toilets, et cetera, and buying the rest, and so our contract will allow us to maybe per, ask for donations on the other ones. Wasn't that part of our process? Okay, first, this isn't something we've discussed, but I don't see any reason it can't be. So, do we, we have a bit? We excluded toilets. Is that what it is? So, I believe the current plumber does have the toilets included. I do recall some of the toilet accessories. I believe is soap dispensers and that. You have stuff. to speak up. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. The soap dispensers and toilet accessories. Those I recall were being furnished by Keel which were not yeah. so I mean I'm not a hundred percent sure what you're I thought we had talked about that we were going to maybe go back and ask uh, the folks who donated to the Performing Arts Center to maybe supply this too but all right um, yeah. so, so hold I on mean, a second if you have the material and it's the right material <coughs> then absolutely you wouldn't pay for that twice well, okay, I just want to be sure the contract's got that leeway in it. Um, and are, are we still all on the same page that this is all going to be done by the uh, end of summer? Is that the target completion? How many weeks did you have in that? Yeah. yeah, that, yes, that would be our target. That's completion. the goal? Yeah. Barring material shortages and everything else that's going on out there? Okay. Yeah. Further questions, Mr. Uh, Long? I have one uh, question and concern uh, when it comes to safety. In the past, uh, we've heard from administration, but also myself, um, have some questions about the locking function of the doors. Um, I noticed that the door is open in, um, so therefore some a student could theoretically blockade themselves in there somehow, or if they fell and were unconscious, be in a way. They also can lock the doors, and I want to make sure that we have a quick and easy way to unlock the doors that we don't have to be scrambling, uh, looking for a master key. Um, I do know that there are um, some features available by some companies that actually have a door that has a jam that um, quickly using something like an Allen wrench uh, type of a, a key can um, loosen the jam, open it up and so that the door can swing then out so if there's anything obstructing in the way, and then also, of course, would defeat the locking mechanism because it's swinging that way that the, there would be a cutout. So if that's one option I know that we're aware of, what options are you guys including in this bid to make sure that we have appropriate safety in case we have a student that locks themselves in there or is barricaded in there or unconscious in front of the door? Um, so I want to be very clear. We responded to an RFP that was issued by the school district. So our bid includes what's listed in that RFP. Because this isn't fully designed, there aren't products and materials spec'd yet. We did carry budget numbers for the comparable products because of the shared photos in the RFP. Um, but we responded as a construction firm to the RFP. We've included a budget number to get the plans designed, state approvals, 
and that, but until we have a contract, we haven't let out any design work. Um, so those types of things haven't been decided, but the district would be involved in that decision making. We would discuss with the district what items and what material you want spec, um, work with the design team. One thing I did, I did reach out out of courtesy because Sheila had mentioned some of these questions. So out of courtesy, I did reach out to a design partner of ours. Um, and he said, well, his first comment was that this is not something that they've ever addressed on a school. So from a code compliance, we can't get state approval without it passing code. Um, but above and beyond, I mean, we fully support whatever the district wants to do. So he did send me a picture of a device. It actually shows occupancy. So if it's locked, it'll show a red and then there will be a red light on. So he said that's something lately that they have been specking, but we don't have anything selected now that we have to worry about, but we would have to factor that into the budget if that would change, you know. Well, truthfully, just a little marker or light that says it's occupied is woefully insufficient for what I'm talking about from safety. Um, and if there's still room during the process to make sure that we have something that's appropriate, I just want to make sure that I understand the process and who I need to communicate, because I do know that uh, a company that has these things, they are for commercial use, they are ADA compliant, and they are also currently used in medical facilities, health facilities, particularly in mental health facilities, where they have issues with um, behavioral issues where patients may lock themselves or barricade, barricade themselves in, into rooms. So it exists. And I want to make sure that I'm not suggesting that that's the product that we need, but I want to make sure that we have a safe product in our in our facility here. Yeah. So I need to understand if it's B and G I need to talk to and forward it to, to our administration or you, but I think that's something very important. And as we move forward, I'd like to hear an update when we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, We know this is your RFP, that's a dollar amount you included. You talked about specking out different materials and things like that. Is there some flexibility and maybe efficiencies that can be gained throughout this process? Dollar wise and, and uh, moving forward, working together with C.D. Smith? Um, definitely. Okay. <laughs> In being completely transparent, um, this process um, was probably not the most efficient process to do any project, let alone a bathroom remodel. Um, we're happy, we believe in partnerships with schools. So we're happy to be here. We're happy to meet with you as many times as needed. That's what we believe in. We believe in a partnership. The competing for the work after we've already gone above and beyond is a little more difficult. We're happy to, what you should know is any project C.D. Smith is involved in, we are going to bid the work and compete for it. Hands down, that's what we have to do on every school that we that we um, partner with. So that's not the issue at all. It's doing the RFP um, after we had already submitted the proposal for it, um, taking the work actually that we did go above and beyond on with the drawings and working with a design firm, putting, you know, all of that together beyond the requirements um, and the request because it's our job to protect you too. So we knew that the original plan, there was opportunity there. Um, so we did go above and beyond to provide drawings in our original submission. I would recommend different processes for going out for any project. Um, in the future, and I'm happy to talk through that at any time. Um, but I know just talking facility study and that whole process, I mean, that's a process that I believe in heavily, just in the best interest of schools fiscally. Um, but, I mean, we are here, where are we, we're, 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 we're at, where we are at now, so we can't go back, but I would recommend different approach when pursuing these projects. And we're having those discussions at the BNG level um, moving forward. Um, and to be fair, because the project had changed scope and, and originally it was attached to a different project, we I believe we needed to legally go out for bids again either way um, because 
legally we need we need to have that um, do that I believe legally so just to understand that's why the second and, and third step ended up happening there and in my perspective I think I'm correct in that so okay. I, I appreciate your sharing your uh, thoughts thank you when we I, I guess I'm just trying to clarify in my mind is um, the when we talked about let's use for some of the materials in the bathrooms we were we we kind of referred to the materials we had in the in the auditorium mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of what's been used to develop the pricing yeah. for this okay so at least we have a baseline yes we have. That of, of product that we were comfortable with once upon a time so I mean okay value engineering could still be done but we, we learned yes. that term yes okay. further questions before we vote We'll vote. Mr. Dijek? Yes. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. Motion passes. Next agenda item, school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you a lot. Thank Sorry. You. Yeah, thanks Look forward for to working with you. Mm -hmm. District-wide school social worker. Attached is a recommendation from Dr. Ebert to add a district-wide social worker position to meet student and staff needs using ESSER funds. I'd seek a motion. So moved. Moved by Mr. Bychek. I will second that. Discussion? I guess if I'm the only one. Um, I'd, I'd like some clarification on the, um, I, I thought I, I'd, well, I, I will continue to request that when we get position changes or other things that take dollars, I would like to have dollars attached to these documents so that we can get an understanding of what we're, um, what we're committing here. Um, and so my question really is kind of in that regard is, so what's the, is, as I understand what we're, we're looking at here is we're gonna hire these folks right away. So that's where we get to two and a half years kind of thing, okay? Um, but I guess what I'd like to know is what's the annual salary that we're talking about, the annual package all in, and what does this amount to in the two and a half years? We like to use for a, a new employee, try to be conservative, but um, the $80,000 mark, anywhere between 70 and 80 we use, um, you know, 50 in salary, 20 or so in, in benefits, assuming someone would take the family uh, health insurance package. So I mean, you can use 75 or 80 as a number and multiply that over two and a half years. Brad, I believe what you sent out via email previously was an average of 77.5. Okay. So 77,500, yep. I believe, is what was communicated to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. so, yep. so, so for clarification, um, that question was answered today. I just want to make sure everyone knows that we saw it as a board. Go ahead, okay. Mr. Um, and we saw it where? Did I miss another email? Yes. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Sorry. Um, and, and the same pay scale is going to apply for both of these? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. And so what we're really voting on tonight is that we're committing to district for two and a half years of this using ESTER funds. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the assumption is, is we're going to try to use the ESSER, the ESSER funds that, that, that disappear sooner. We're going to use those first and go into the second. That's correct. All right. Yes. But we're talking about a $400,000 commitment here. Oh, if we could do the math here. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> In my head. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I just, because that's obviously, that's coming out of the ESSER money. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. We got a lot less left. All right. I support the positions. I, I, mm -hmm. I again, I, the challenge day thing has been very um, challenging to me. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. And I came away from that experience um, Understanding that there's lots of challenges within our families in the district. Correct. Just a just a comment, Randy, if I can. Um, yes, we will use ESSER two first, and that's what DPI would like us to do. Um, ESSER three does come with one rule that the other two did not, in that twenty percent of your allocation needs to be spent on addressing long term learning loss. Um, so I will make sure that we hit that threshold first on the, the S or three funds. Um, so there may be some 
movement around as to where we make those claims to make sure we're being efficient with how we get reimbursed for these costs. The requirement is what? 20% of the allocation needs to be spent on addressing learning loss for the oh, SRE. Okay. I thought you said hearing loss, and I oh, was, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling with my hearing aids here, and it's like, how can you spend that? I mean, I, I bought some expensive hearing aids, but okay, thank you. None of the other little, grants. Little, little, little old guy joke here. Thank none you. of the other grants had anything um, with them that actually designated that funds had to be spent on something. I mean, they all have their list of allowable costs, uh, but that was the one component that was unique with ESSER mm -hmm. three. And Randy, one other piece, or all board members. Um, so you had mentioned that we'll have a lot less. Um, yes, but even if you take into account the the director position and the in, and assuming these two positions go through tonight, we still believe some back of the napkin math would tell us three or four hundred thousand is what we'll still have available. So, um, because, right, I'd yeah. like to see that napkin. But okay. For, for further questions. No problem. Prepared to vote, Mr. Ohm. Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Motion passes. Next agenda item, district-wide school counselor position. Attaches a recommendation from Dr. Ebert to add a full-time district-wide school counselor position to help meet student needs. The funding for this position would be covered through ESSER funds. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Johannes. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. second by Mr. Schaefer. Discussion? Sorry, Stuart, you didn't get that second. Right. Hearing none, seeing none, we'll vote. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Mr. Bychik? Yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. The motion passes. Next agenda item, ground rules for town hall open forum meeting. Uh, discuss date and ground rules for a town hall open forum meeting. So this came from the community. Um, you know, tonight we had no one uh, share any information. I, I just, what, what is the board th board's thoughts on this town hall meeting? Possible dates, or what do we have for possible dates? A Wednesday night in lieu of a board meeting? I guess I would ask if somebody could remind me what the goal is. I mean, I understand that the goal was that they want to have a back and forth, but is it just to have an argument or is it to have a debate? Uh, a debate on what subject matter, just anything that comes up? Is it, you know, to try to embarrass somebody? Are, you, are we going to argue? Are we going to shout? Um, I understand those are the ground rules, but again, what it, what is the purpose of uh, what we want to come away with? This isn't uh, my understanding that the purpose of this isn't to vet any individuals before the election to determine what their positions are and, and whether or not you support support them and will vote for them. Um, so to grill myself about how I feel about something when I've already been elected to the board, I'm not sure what the purpose is. If somebody could help me understand. I was of the understanding it was more for the community to seek clarification on some of the issues because they're not allowed that during the board meetings. They can talk and make points, but we can't really say what our views are on that same subject. And so I'm looking at it as a time for the community to have some clarification uh, as individuals, not as a board. Then they should reach out to us as individuals or if they have want to know the board position, then can they not submit the questions before the meeting to the um, district administrator and or board president to have it included on the agenda. Wouldn't that be the proper way to handle it then? I guess that's why we're having this discussion. <laughs> yeah, I had the same concerns. Uh, you know, I've had plenty of conversations in my driveway, plenty of conversations on my cell phone. And quite frankly, I've reached out to people that have had concerns and, and the response was pretty blatantly please do never contact me again. If you don't, if you don't want to tell me at the board meeting, I don't ever want to, I don't want to hear from you. I mean, so, um, you know, I, I, my question is, how does this benefit the district? How does this benefit students? I would agree. I think this is considering the fact that we have, an, I mean, I don't want to get political, but it's the facts of the election cycle. 
there's eight people running for three uh, three three positions, and uh, I don't think that it's appropriate for a board meeting to turn into a town hall at this point in time. If candidates want to pursue this on their own, they can certainly pursue that, but this should not be a board function at this point. And that's not that's not about not sharing ideas or not sharing your point of view. This is not a function of the board. This is a this is an election issue. Um, that's my personal belief on this and why this is being pursued. So I don't think it's appropriate given what time it is in the year and an election coming up with eight people running for three spots. Would you suggest we have it after the election? I would entertain that discussion if there was something that we were trying to seek clarity to. An open forum to say, oh, I have a beef with this. And then the next one says, I have a beef with this. And I have a beef with this. Other times that we've done this, we've discussed a particular issue. So if we're going to lay ground rules for these things, let's talk about an issue and not make it about anything and everything that there is a complaint from in the community. But shouldn't the board know about some of those issues? Absolutely. Okay. And there's forums for those things to happen. I. I respectfully disagree. I mean, we give people three minutes. Mr. Um, Mr. Ohm, could I answer that before you move on? You, you have the floor just as soon as I'm done answering. I've had people in my tractor. I've had people in my driveway. Other board members have had people in their driveway. I get phone calls. I get emails. I go to grocery stores. I go to basketball games. I go to football games. Every one of us, I believe, has made themselves extremely available. So to say there's not a forum where they can learn things from board members about their specific viewpoints on things, I think is, uh, I would argue with that statement. So go ahead, that's that's where I stand on, on that. Yeah, well, okay. And and again, the reality here is, is that, I mean, this was, this was asked for back in October. And the fact that it's now in the middle of the election cycle is, you know, a matter of the timing that we've chosen to put it in. So, um, Whatever. I, be, I believe the community has asked for this. They should be given an opportunity. There has to be a way that we can identify the topics that can be discussed, should be discussed. There's a civil way to do this. But how we get it done and when we get it done is obviously, I mean, it, it, I don't see how we get it done by the election, before the election. And again, maybe it isn't appropriate at this point. But uh, again, it was asked for back in October. I agree with all those points. So. I would agree that it's not appropriate before the election, but when you say the community asked for this, can you quantify that for me? Yes, we had some community members here during the annual meeting that made a motion, but I guess, can you quantify what it means that the community wanted this? The community wants to provide feedback, whether it's three minutes or 15 minutes, if we have you know, five members come up and talk about the same subject matter in th over three minutes, and are organized, which was clearly the case during the annual meeting that they organized ahead of time, they can bring issues forward. They can share their concerns. There is a process. If they're unhappy with their teacher, they should be talking to their teacher first, not talking to us. And if they're not satisfied with the answer from the teacher, then they talk to the administrator. If they're not satisfied with the answer they get from the administrator, then they talk to the district administrator. Because I do have a beef with my teacher, or if I'm not happy with something that's happening in the math class, I don't come to the school district first. There's a process. And if you want to skip it, you can. You can still send us emails. You can still contact us. As uh, President Meyer stated, we're at many events. I can speak to myself seeing uh, President Meyer at many events. I've seen Mr. Schaefer at many events. Um, I've been at many events. Um, I've seen Mr. Johannes at many events. Um, we're available and there's a way to share your concerns. I mean, my goodness, 30 years ago, where it was an email, but now with, um, the, with the technology we have, we're live streaming this meeting that wasn't available before. So we have more people available to see what's going on. We're doing more and more using technology and the way to communicate both, both ways. And somehow we have somebody that believes that they can't be heard or they haven't been heard when they're writing letters to the editor or showing up here yelling and screaming and they're not being heard enough that we now have to schedule another opportunity for them just to 
do what? Again, I ask the question, what do they wish to accomplish? If they feel that they're not being heard, that's different than they can't be, that they're not sharing their thoughts. The only response I can give you, Stuart, is that group that was here felt they weren't being heard. So I, again, you, I... But is the forum gonna change that? Is an open forum gonna change? Because again, the difference of being heard or being listening, or you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, therefore you're not listening to me, or you're heard, but we disagree. I think that's the, the difference. Frust the frustration is they're being heard, but they're not being responded to in that time and place. And that is, and that's, what and that's the the how the meeting has been for 40 years or longer. So why is it different now? Because they feel that the only place they deserve an answer is here, but they're unwilling to reach out to me or talk to me any other time besides a school board meeting. What has traditionally been the circumstances in which we would have a open forum, an open forum or a town hall? I know we had one for the Performing Arts Center because there were specific changes to what was happening with the Performing Arts Center and, there, and that went to referendum and there was a difference in what was being addressed at that point. Is that the type of circumstance that a board meeting would turn into an open forum? In my experience here, it has. We also, um, when I first arrived, we had you know, some budget difficulties and we put together a, a presentation to explain to the community how we got there and then certainly took feedback um, and ideas and thoughts. Same thing again with, you know, many, many referendum meetings. Um, so those are the two examples I can give you, but yes, typically there was a, a bigger item that, uh, we we're maybe looking for community feedback on. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was set up in the form of a meeting and, and feedback was solicited and everyone knew what we'd be talking about. So that within my five years, that's what I, I can recall. Okay. And just to clarify yeah. my 10 years, it's been bound by a topic specific to a topic, not just a wide open, um, come with your questions. And then if you bring a question that's obscure that we have to look something up, we're not answering it during the forum I, anyway. So and that's in and, and those types of meetings are prior to some type of decision that's going to be come in front of the board, correct? Most likely, yeah. What's unique this time is not unique to this district at this time. Um, talk to several board presidents, many school board members at the state convention. All the same conversations are happening in all the same districts. Um, th th this almost word for word verbatim, uh, some of the things that are being said at our meeting are also being said in Kansas City school districts where my my sister has kids in the, in the suburbs. So it's an organized effort and, and uh, Many school districts are struggling with it because it, it seems to be a constant attack. Um, please, community members, communicate with us. But to, to give a platform or a soapbox without any goal or, or without any benefit to our students for, for whatever movement's going on in, some back, in the background that's being pushed nationally, I don't see the purpose of it at this time. I can support an open forum, but I want to know again, what's the goal and what's the topic? I don't believe it's just, you know, the goal is just to try to bait people into arguments. And what's the purpose of the debate? Who, who's who got the, the best one-liner to put the other person down? I mean, what are we really seeking to accomplish? And that's what I, that's the question I would pose to those that want to open forum. What's the goal to accomplish? There's been calls for transparency. And I'm talking personally, if anybody wants to talk to me about any subject, I'd be glad to answer them. And if that's the forum that they choose to ask me that question, and if I want to answer it at that time, I will. That's all it, that's all it means to me. Go ahead, Mr. Holm. Step one is the problem with each of you addressing those questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the rest of the board members don't get to hear your, your positions. Um, number two is if you're concerned about what, what the folks want to talk about, maybe we just ought to ask them. 
um, I think that's that's what they're begging for is an opportunity to put in front of us concerns that they have and have a dialogue. That's I'm done. Thank you. I, I'm just going to say, what's the criteria? When do we determine when there's an open forum and when there's not? When we're loud, when when uh, certain members of the community are loud enough. I mean, what is the criteria? We can't. We shouldn't just go into these things and just say, "Well, this time we're going to do it, but next time your concerns, eh, we're not going to do it for you." There should be some standards set for what you know, wh whatever the topic. It doesn't matter the topic, a group that's pushing for it, any of it. We should have some standardized process for how we go about doing these things, and and we don't. So if we're not going to be equal in how we how we address this when some other group may have some other issue they want to deal with, then we shouldn't be doing it for anybody else either. So this is not necessarily a topic issue. This is a process issue. This is um, I don't believe in, a, in an election a function of the board. This is something that certainly can be done outside of this. Unfortunately, Randy, I'm going to have to make a comment. You're concerned about a one-on-one -on -one conversation I might have with somebody else and that the other board members don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I think that's way over the line that you need to know every conversation I have with any, every person in this community. Can you share with me every meeting you've been to outside of the board meetings with other community members here or this, this particular group? Have you attended any of their meetings? or met with them after a board meeting and chatted with them out in the parking lot? Have you shared with me what you said to them? I mean, come on. I mean, now you're, you're suggesting that we can't talk to community members on our own time if I'm not telling you who I'm talking to and what I'm telling them. Well, you're, that's what you're I missed, understood. You're, missed, that's, you're misunderstanding my comment, but we're well, not, that's, I, we I, aren't gonna argue about well, it. Well, okay, but I did <clears throat> misunderstand your comment. Would you like to clarify it, please? No, I don't want to clarify it. Okay. it this isn't going anywhere. Now we're debating. That's that's. But you made let's a comment, move on. But you made a comment. I wanted to clarify. That's all. Thank you. You know, Phil, you mentioned it's a process, and you're right about that. And maybe this is a healthy thing to have every year, every other year. Just have an open forum. Doesn't have to be about a singular topic and brought up by any singular group. Just have a group of folks here who want to ask ask us questions. I don't see the harm. So are you suggesting that's what we do right now is go ahead move forward and set some ground rules or do we what is the process here for going about this first so, i think we select a, if we go forward with it i would start with a date and i think you're wise to choose something after the elections we're not kicking the can down the road we're just being smart about it the answers will still be there the questions will still be there and you're suggesting that this would be different than the annual meeting and that we would respond to questions yes. and things like that? Correct. Because I, I I could sense frustration and when people are asking us questions or bringing up points and we sit here mute. And I want to jump out of my seat sometimes, but I can't say anything. But that's not going to change after the forum because if somebody comes to the next board meeting and has a question, and wants to talk about a subject that's not posted on the agenda, we're not going to be able to answer it. So then are we going to schedule another open forum? That goes to the process again. That goes to the process. Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't make that meeting. So now I'm bringing my questions now. You know what I'm saying? That's a hypothetical. So it's a process question to what right. Mr. Schaefer says. Then what's the process and what qualifies? We'll discuss that when we come up with a date, if we decide to have this. So, so I think some of the concept behind the open forum is, is misunderstanding of civics and school board rules. Um, you know, we've been elected by the community to, to perform this duty and, and to be responsive to individuals. That doesn't mean as a group, but as individual board members. Uh, and I am extremely uncomfortable with, with a group setting where we're, we're expected to respond to community members and Pick on Mr. Uh, Schaefer because he's sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to be kind enough so, so he doesn't uh, take me out to the woodshed here shortly. But um, Mr. Schaefer says something. At that point, it, it can be a representation of the board. What, what, come, what comes out of his mouth? 
it gets published in the paper, oh, the board thinks this, this, and this, because two members said something and were very vocal at a meeting. And I don't think that's good representation of what a board is. I, I think you go back to um, board roles and, and you know things that were talked about even at the uh, convention uh, two weeks ago, whenever the heck that was. Um, board's voice is their vote individual board members we can stand up on a pulpit and we can uh, preach on a soapbox all day long but our voice is our vote so again i'm, I'm not opposed to a public forum but i, I just I, i'm i, I again I, I don't know the purpose we, we again we have opportunity for people to speak at meetings and, and i've reached out to people in the past after meetings to, to have, have the dialogue with, with some success and, and with bitter failure um, also other times so Go ahead, Mr. Dietrich. Well, I think what the public is looking for, as has been described, or my perception of it is, they want a, you know, a chance to be heard. And I think that's a fair request. And we, you know, I understand why we give them a limited amount of time at a meeting like this, and it has to be on a topic, and that, that's good parliamentary procedure. But I do think, and I agree with, with Phil, that you know, if we're going to have something like this, and I think that's something we should certainly consider, then we do outline, okay, here's the ground rules. And if somebody goes off the path and starts throwing barbs and stuff, we stop it right there. But I, I think you still need to give the chance for them to tell a concern or tell a, hey, you guys are doing a wonderful job or whatever, you know? and. I guess if I was in that position and, again, felt like I'm not having a chance to do that, and granted, if they miss the meeting, well, we can't help that. But I do think we need to show transparency, as Jim said, and our you know, interest, if that's the right word, or mine, of, okay, what's on your mind in a reasonable present presentation? Not half an hour long, but, you know, okay, Here's what they're concerned about, whatever it might be. And we're not going to get into a tete-a-tete. -tete. We might, you know, answer questions. But when someone, I meet them in the grocery store and they say, Dan, we're really concerned about whatever. Okay, I'll take that under advisement. I'm not going to get into a discussion with them about, well, I agree with you, you know, so to speak, you know, because that's what happens. And well, so-and-so said, you know, Mr. Dietrich thinks that's a great idea. So... Again, it, it doesn't mean that I don't or do, but I, I think they, they deserve an opportunity with specified uh, regulations or whatever you want to call it, stipulations. You know, and again, I think the time has to be after the election because that could skew it, whether it's for any candidate. I guess I have a question again, in seeking clarity. Do they want to be heard or did they want a response? Because my understanding, again, is that they want to ask us questions and they want responses. And that's what I heard from Mr. Bychek was that they're frustrated because they show up here with a question expecting to get an answer when they don't understand the process because they show up. You know, so is it they want to be heard or do they want a response? And that's and, and that's two completely different things, because if they want to be heard, there's op plenty of opportunities. I also believe if they want a response, I can only provide an individual response for myself. For us to line up in front, you know, line up in front of a group in an open forum, you, we can go through, well, what's your opinion? 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 What's my opinion? But what did that change? Now everybody knows what your opinion is, but I show up at these board meetings with an opinion and with an, maybe an educated opinion and do my research before the meeting, but I show up with an open mind and I listen to the debate and listen to the discussion and listen to the feedback to make sure that I've seen it from all perceptions and weighed all sides. So just because I have an opinion doesn't mean that that's where I'm gonna ultimately land on an issue before I've heard all sides. So again, I'm confused with number one. I don't believe that there's a pro good process here of what we determine when we do in open forums. Number two, if it's just wide open and it's not bound by a topic, then it's going to be all over the place. Um, 
and I'm not number three, I'm not sure what it's going to accomplish or change for our students in the district. What's the, going to be the benefit ultimately for the students in our district to have an open forum when we have show up and have no idea what the goal is or the topic is? Well, I didn't say that. Stuart. No, no, I said, no, no, no. This isn't directed at you. Don't take it personally. I'm not. I'm just I was you. I was pointing out that I heard two different themes here being heard, which you were talking about, and then from Mr. Bycheck wanting a response. So that's what I was pointing out is that there was two different themes here. And I think that just being heard is not what's being asked for or enough. So it wasn't personal, personally directed at no, you. I, I'm not saying that. I just want to make clear what I was trying to point out. You know, I think they have a right or uh, deserve a chance to be heard. And I think they have to understand, okay, Here's topics that they present, if that's what they're concerned about. But we're not going to get, as I said, I'm not going to get into a tete-a-tete -tete with anybody about it or respond in any given way. But it gives them a chance to be heard. So you're don't they deserve that? You're suggesting they're not being heard now? Well, I'm asking the question. You say they deserve to be heard. So are you telling me they're not being heard right now? Well, apparently they feel like they're not. And... Again, are we transparent? Yes, we, we have a meeting where they can show up. We have committee meetings that are open to the public. We have this board meeting that's open to the public. We have reams and reams upon documentation that's available on our website. They can request additional information. And so if there's something that they can't see because it's a personal student record, we're being accused of not being transparent? No. Could we have an agenda item for next meeting since we're not going to have this forum anytime soon, it seems, uh, asking people what do they want from the forum. That may move it closer, but again, that, that's that's my question. I don't see. How and we then we can start forward. making guidelines and ground rules after we hear. You know, you keep asking what do people want from this right. meeting and inferring. Well, let's ask the people to come in and tell us what they want. Is that an agenda item? <laughs> so Phil, but give us some feedback. I think you well, like might have an opinion. Well, sure, I, I guess we can, you know, I, I don't know the, the correct way to do it, solicit the, their, the, the way in which they want, you know, anybody who wants a public forum wants it to happen or what they want the goal to be. It's not an agenda item, because now we're sitting there having a, you know, are we just lining people up to give their, when has that been part of our process? That has never been part of our process. Somebody wants to stand up there and read community feedback or write a letter or do those types of things, completely fine. Share those things. Hey, I think this is the, what, we, what you as a board should be doing. We listen to it all the time. We've read hundreds of letters. That's what we do. It's not an agenda item. It's not a function of the board to, do, to sit there and, and, and have this as a... <laughs> this just seems way out in right field to me that I, I'm just, I'm struggling to even comprehend this conversation a little bit that, right. that, that we're doing this. Well, it's an agenda item today. And if people knew that, hey, you know, maybe we want more feedback and be a little bit more specific what you want, maybe more people would have showed up and told us. I make a motion that we table the discussion about town hall open forum meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion before we vote? Mr. Johannes? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Ohm? No. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Bycheck? No. Motion passes. Any further motions to be made under ground rules for town hall open forum? Next agenda item, COVID-19 update, Dr. Ebert. Okay, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, not a whole lot uh, new to report this time. Um, since our last meeting, and I'll just share out, we uh, at Keele High School last week, six positives um, among students, two staff members that tested positive. Keele Middle School, three students tested positive, zero staff members. And um, Salinas Elementary had two students and two staff test positive. This week we have zeros at the Hill High School, zeros at the middle school, 
and one student that tested positive so far, three days, um, at the elementary school. So um, neither myself, the admin team, or the nursing staff believes that uh, we should be bringing anything to you at this time that would change the way we're handling our, our own situation. Um, and um, I, I really don't have any more to report other than that. Thank you. Thank you. Any Question. questions? Yes. Um, how did the new CDC guideline of this much and then five days, whatever, has that, I mean, and we offered the one that we had been offering, was there any, we didn't have a lot of cases, so that wasn't a big deal as, as per se? Not that I've, I've heard okay. from parents, so. I mean, um, parents weren't like, hey, what the hey? Nope, nope. Okay. Nope. A couple reached out to me after I sent the clarification email. I had some questions, a couple concerns maybe, or, or thoughts to maintain the 10 days. Um, but um, our nurses have done a great job communicating with families, so. Any Thank further? You. We don't have a bullet point on here for uh, items removed from um, uh, the agenda for uh, <clears throat> the consent agenda, um, but we had uh, MOU with Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Randy requested that to be removed. Yes, um, I did. Go ahead. Um, I, have, I have several questions in the, relative to this document. Um, first question is, is who drafted this document? Our attorney, their attorney, where did it come from? Came from the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. Okay, and has our attorney looked at this? No. Okay, and is there a, a regular contract that's gonna be signed or is this the document? Is this the contract? This is it, as far, far as I understand it. As far as I know, yes, this is it. All right, um, I, I guess, um, I, I believe there are some challenges in this document. Um, as you go through the document, um, it talks about, you know, we're going to, we're going to do, um, you know, work to mutually agreed goals, et cetera, et cetera. And yet none of that's defined in here. So again, if this is a contract, we should know what we're going to ask to measure. Um, number two is they're paying all compensation, no reference to the budget we agreed on. Um, and again, we don't even know if we're charging or not yet. Um, the, um, again, the, 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 we're, they're going to pay all staff, but no relation to, again, the rates and the, the, the dollars that we um, talked about. Um, we're supposed to provide uh, curricular resources. There's no indication if that's new stuff or existing stuff or how much money that's gonna cost. Um, there's a clause in here that says access to student records um, of all the people that are gonna participate. Don't we need to get parent approval for doing that? Um, um, uh, KS, you know, the school district engages in resource development which I'm assuming resource development is fundraising, and so how are we doing on that so far? And who controls that fundraising? Um, the, it specifically says the Kiel School District only, is only interested in results. Um, let me go to that section, please. The KSAD is interested only in the results to be achieved. The conduct and control of the work is, is, is solely with the Boys and Girls Club. I believe that phrase should say subject to our policies and defined results. Um, the, um, and then we get to the whole thing about how does the money transfer? There's no, there's no commentary in here about our $100,000 commitment. So it's like, I can read this to say, we're gonna spend money and you somehow send us money. There's no talk about when we're gonna send money, up front, in arrears. And then the coup de grace in this is that, and oh, by the way, um, it's a three year deal. I mean, subject to cancellation, but it's a three year deal. Um, 
our minutes specifically were a hundred thousand dollars for one year mm -hmm. yep. um, automatically renew it unless we give them three months prior notice well three months prior notice to june 30th is april and we're not going to have a clue what we're doing in april because we're not done with the school year and then the last thing it has it has nothing in here about what days are actually going to operate so i would like to make a motion that this be referred back to the finance committee to clean up i disagree there's a, there's a motion there's on a motion. the table is there a second Motion fails for lack of second. Mr. Long? Let's talk about a process again here. Number one, I'm not throwing Dr. Ebert under the bus, but I think he may have misspoken. This is not a contract. It's just as it says at the top. Memorandum of understanding so that we can move forward with the next steps. If, and then the second question is when I talk about process, I saw this already much earlier in the week, was it last? Was it already on Friday available? Somebody remind me, because yeah, I've read it more than once. Mm -hmm. So if there was questions about whether our attorney saw it or not, or we felt that an attorney should have seen it, why wasn't Dr. Ebert notified that ahead of this meeting? Why do we why do we wait to this meeting to ambush him saying, how come the attorney hasn't seen this yet? That could have been done ahead of time. Also, talking about $100,000 that we're just going to give them, Per the meeting minutes, it was in the budget to set $100,000 aside, not pay them $100,000. It was only a budgetary line item. These are valid questions, but again, what is the process if you want to dive into certain things? And I believe the process is this is a moratorium or a memorandum of understanding to go forward into the next steps of work out the details. Also, some of those details as far as what days it's going to operate was already presented. Okay, so if it's not in here, we do have documentation other places. So to act like we don't know is completely false. We know what was presented as far as what days are going to operate, correct? I don't Ms. believe so. Mr. Yes. Mr. Schaefer has hand up. Go ahead, Mr. Schaefer. Listen. This may say memorandum of, memorandum of understanding on the top of the page. Nothing in here reads like an MOU. It reads absolutely like a contract that says you're going to do this. Okay. And we have been, I, I think that this board at times, or we have been a little lax in some of the language and some of the documents. And to Mr. Holmes' credit, he's pointed those out. And I, I would agree that I don't think that this is, those are valid questions to ask. And I think at a minimum, um, an attorney needs to go over this document sure, and, and, and see this before before we are we are absolutely approving it. If indeed it's, we believe it's contractual, yes. But I believe that then that was all that needed to be discussed. Going into all these other things. And like I said, knowing when this is, good, if this indeed is the contract language and it's supposed to spell out when the payments are going to be made, how the payments are going to be made, who's going to issue the invoice to whom, and you want all those details spelled out, then that's information to tell Brad that we want to see it and have the contract, have the attorney go to it. Telling it to give it back to the finance committee to clean it up, I think is, is not proper. Then give him some guidance of what you were looking for as far as the process. And if we see these things ahead of time where we could have got engaged the attorney before this meeting, then by gosh, when we get the information in the board packet on Friday and we read it Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, then make a phone call or send an email to the district office and say, did the attorney look at this yet? We're Mr. wasting Schaefer. time. Um, I just wanna be clear. We have no indication that there's a following, a document to follow this. That there's something else coming that is going to, be, to spell out some of these issues. No. Um, then I would make a motion that we refer this um, refer this back for review by um, by our attorneys. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? What is the motion? To refer it back to, to refer it back to be reviewed by the attorney. If I could respond. Go ahead. Um, I 
I chose to do it this way because every time I try to go direct to Dr. Ebert, I'm criticized in one way or the other for um, being overbearing, being whatever. Um, and again, I read this, I believe this was the contract that was going to be signed and I believe it's flawed. And it was a pro I believe it's appropriate for this board to understand how flawed it is. And it was the only way that I believed I was going to get it to be referred back. And you obviously chose not to second my original motion. So um, I hope somebody works through it. Okay, so Thank if you. we referred it back to finance, then the finance committee would have said the same thing. Can we have our attorney look at it? So why can't we do that tonight? Because I think the finance committee could talk through some of these issues. Do we want to pay in a, in advance? Do we want to pay in arrears? Randy, you're uh, you're the chairman of the finance committee. You control the agenda. Put it on the agenda then. You know, I don't control the agenda, Stuart. Yes, you do. No, you I a, don't. You have a right to put on the agenda what you like. We have a motion on the table. Is there further discussion? So just to be clear, it's going back, but there is going to be a subsequent, once this MO gets finalized or approved here, there will be an actual contract. Not that I'm aware of. Why not? Because I don't know that that's the case, Dan. That's why we're going to hope, that's why we're voting on giving you to an attorney and see what that, what legal says. I, I believe Mr. Schaefer is right. I mean, if this, no matter what you call it, if it meets the criteria of a contract, it's a contract. And, and again, this, I've read lots of contracts in my time. This contract is almost unenforceable because there's nothing in here about consideration. And yet our giving them our buildings to use may be enough to make this a contract as it stands. But I think somebody needs to work out some of the details of this before we send it back to our attorney or otherwise our meter is just spinning. Why are we debating whether this is a contract or not? That's what we have an attorney for and whether it's an enforceable contract or whether it's not an enforceable contract. And if there's certain elements that we want and let's start, you know, get a list together of what elements we think that belong on there. But I, I think we, we're done with debate. I think Mr. Bychek was looking to call a vote. Is that what I seen you indicate earlier? Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bychek. Can we'll you repeat vote? the motion? Thank you. Go ahead, Sheila. Can we you back to the attorney for review? We'll vote. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. I'll say yes. Mr. Johannes? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Motion passes. Um, I, I think you've heard Dr. Ebert that we want more clarification also. Um, maybe, maybe more, as Stuart referred to, some of the steps in the process. Is that what I heard from the board? Um, so when, that, when that, comes, that document comes back to us, we can answer some of those questions, if possible. If we can get clarification from that group. I'll be happy to provide you my list if you want it. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of if I want it or not. It's a matter of if your fellow board members want us to investigate um, and add those pieces into this MOU. I think it's up to the attorney to tell us. Because if the attorney tells us that this is not an enforceable contract, then it's a moot point. Then we're spending a lot of time talking about something that isn't contractual and, and isn't enforceable. So that it would mean some follow-up. So by all means, take it into consideration. From, Ms. from Mr. Ohm, if anybody else has anything else to add, I would ask the rest of the board if, if they can forward their thoughts. Nothing is being codified at this point when you're talking about consulting with the attorney. That's my understanding. Are we asking, we're not asking for anything to be codified here. No, I would agree that if Mr. Ohm has his points and he has them documented and written down, those can be provided to the attorney as concerns. Uh, I, mean, I think they're valid points to ask. Because I think, I mean, granted, we're not arguing about MOUs versus contracts because I'm not an attorney, um, but I think those are valid questions to ask, and the attorney can, can certainly consider 
those types of issues because that's what the discussion was around tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. So if there's nothing further, we'll move on. Uh, the next agenda item, and uh, it's up to the board how they want to proceed. We're at 9 or 8.40. Um, we have closed session this evening as well. Uh, school board convention reports was the next agenda item. Um, I'm sure the gentlemen that, that were at the school board convention are going to be brief as, as normal. Um, but would it be okay if we held off till the next meeting on that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess we're moving on. Uh, future agenda items? Anything to add, take away? Where are we going to add the town hall? I mean, the uh, town hall discussion? I believe we tabled it at this time. It's tabled, but how do we take it off the table if we want to discuss it at a future agenda item? Is you you asked to have it put, it put back on the agenda. Right. If, uh, so does the majority of the so board want to see that? So Mr. Bychek is asking about a future agenda item. Uh, are you, do you want to propose a month where we maybe take a look at that again, potentially? Uh, you think maybe after the, the new board's on board or the, the after the elections process? I think we should just keep it on the agenda for next time. If we have some uh, community members that come in next week and during discussion, you know, kind of address what they're looking for, it might give us something to discuss then and kind of and solidify uh, dates and or ground rules. So we're gonna have the same discussion next uh, or next meeting? Shorter. Well, I'm seeking, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's what I'm seeing clarification. I'm seeking clarification as well. Do we just want to put the word out that please share with us what, what the goals are and what your what your thoughts are? So, so, so perhaps we wait to see what the feedback is and, and see see where that goes and then put it on the following agenda item. That's Let, fair. Let's, 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 let's give it a little breather here and go from there, if that would be fair. I can live with that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Any further for future agenda items? I'm glad we're so comical here today. Thank you for the crowd's uh, feedback. So on the next agenda item will be the convention reports? Yes, also at the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, review and reflection, I think, is where we're headed now. If there's nothing further on the future agenda items. Apologize for seemingly rushing things along, but uh, we, it's, it's trying to keep things moving. If there's nothing for review and reflection, I'd seek a motion to vote to convene to, into executive session under Wisconsin Statute 19.851C, F, and G to discuss the administrator contracts, update an employee health situation, and to confer with legal counsel on strategy for addressing board member conduct, which involves confidential student and employee information, and which is likely to re result in litigation. So moved. Moved by Mr. Bychek. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Dietrich. Discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Johannes? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Bychek? Yes. Mr. Dietrich? Yes. Mr. Ohm? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. I'll say yes. After a short re recess, we will reconvene in closed session. <laughs>